Welcome to Safe on Deck. For episode 26, I sat down with Captain Robert Riker in Fairhope, Alabama. Rooster was raised in an aviation family and chose to follow in his father's footsteps as a professional pilot, earning his private pilot's license just after his 17th birthday. Following graduation from the University of Saskatchewan with a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics, Rooster joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Upon completion of his first assignment instructing student pilots in the CT-114 Tutor, Rooster reported to Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma, where he completed an exchange tour with the U.S. Air Force flying the E-3 Sentry Airborne Warning and Control Aircraft. Rooster was handpicked from amongst his peers to serve as an AWACS instructor pilot, and he flew operational missions in both the Balkans and the Middle East. Next, Rooster was selected to serve on the Snowbirds Air Demonstration Squadron, where he flew as an opposing solo and lead solo. Rooster attended the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California and returned home to Canada to the Aerospace Test Establishment in Cold Lake, Alberta to fly flight test sorties on the CP-140 Aurora and the de Havilland DHC-5 Buffalo. In 2009, Rooster retired from the Air Force and accepted a position with Bombardier Aerospace as an engineering test pilot. Rooster worked extensively on the design and development of the C-Series aircraft and the Challenger 350, where he served as project pilot during a major avionics upgrade. In 2019, Rooster joined Airbus Americas in Mobile, Alabama as an experimental test pilot where he was selected to fly the first A220 assembled on the Mobile assembly line. Rooster's logged more than 10,000 hours in a variety of aircraft, including his immaculate Starduster aerobatic biplane, and he's an active member of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. Thanks for taking the time to listen. In the future, I plan to continue to share similar interviews with both current and retired military aviators. If you have a question or a suggestion for a future interview, please leave it as a comment below. Safe on Deck, Episode 26 with Captain Robert Reichert. Enjoy. Rooster, thanks again for taking the time on another rainy day here in beautiful, uh, I guess we're in Alabama, not in Pensacola today, but thanks for taking the time to come over and uh, speak with me here in Fairhope. Uh, I start these all the same way, so I'll start yours the same way as well. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. S- Saskatchewan. Good yeah, Lord. Tell me, S's. Indeed. Yeah. Tell me about Canada. Uh, well, Canada is, uh, we're the friendliest place in the world, apparently. Um, I don't know. I decided to leave a little bit and been living in the States. But, yeah, it's a great place to be from uh, and to go back to. But I still uh, I still really like coming down here and, and living in the U.S., especially down in Alabama. If, if you spend any time in Canada, you know that the winters are hellish. And so uh, you do one of those and you quickly discover that, you know what, maybe this is not for me since there is warmer temperatures out there. So that's kind of why I kind of migrated. So, uh, But do... Uh, you know, great fondness, obviously, for Canada. For sure. I got the chance to visit uh, once when I was in Civil Air Patrol as a cadet. It was an international air cadet exchange, an okay. IACE trip. And uh, it was a summertime, awesome whitewater raft. We had a wonderful time. It was so great. Super. I got to see a Spitfire fly. What what more could you ask for? But the bugs, the mosquitoes were right. legendary. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Special strains. <laughs> yeah, big aviators there. Speaking of aviation, uh, what drove you into Do you remember a first distinct memory when you said that's... I don't know, this is something I love, this is something I want to pursue, not even just as a career, but what was your first initial hook for aviation? Well, so my dad was a pilot, and he, he worked as a pilot. He was a commercial pilot, but he had his own business. He was an aerial photographer, um, so he was kind of a one-man band. And um, so as a result of that, we had airplanes, small airplanes, like not big airplanes, like uh, tail draggers, those sorts of things, Aronka Chief. And uh, so I was always really enamored with flying I always wanted to be a pilot I can't think of a time when I didn't want to be a pilot and um, you know I had two other brothers neither of them flew or wanted to fly so it was kind of weird I'm like and I'm the only guy that didn't have to have glasses so it was almost like I was destined for that so not that you can't fly with glasses it just makes it a little bit more problematic particularly if you have aspirations to go in the military for obvious reasons and so um anyways yeah i've just always been around airplanes my whole life do you um, remember that first flight where you i'm guessing you were probably pretty young but yeah I, you, well there's lots of moments i mean there's a couple of you know things that he, my dad's no longer with us anymore he passed away a few years back so uh, you know lots of times when you're flying i have my own airplane and i fly a little bit and that takes me back because it's similar to tail dragger so it kind of takes me back to that you know, the roots of where I kind of started flying, you know, and there's one time when I was with my dad and we were flying, uh, we, we camped out in a field. We just picked a field and he landed in it, basically. And I'm like, I didn't think that somebody else owned that place. He just kind of landed in it. We 
you know, pitched a tent, stayed the night there, got up in the morning and took off. In those days, you could do that. I don't think you'd be able to get away with that. Now, I just can't think, unless you own the land yourself, right? Take off out of your own runway, come back, land, and pitch a tent. <laughs> Maybe out west somewhere. I think there's probably a lot of BLM land or something. Per, yeah. Perhaps. Not around perhaps. here. Perhaps. Not around, yeah, yeah. Not around here for sure. So, you know, and lots of little stories like that, lots of memories and stuff that take me back. And then, of course, wanting to be a pilot, I just was always so interested in it. Even when I was in high school, I was grade 10, and I was getting a ride to the airport to do my ground school and just kind of always moving towards that official part of flying not really certain where I wanted to be I was about 70 to 80 percent certain I want to be a military pilot but I also kind of wanted to fly in the bush uh, which means up in northern Canada and all around there and floats and that sort of thing because that was very obviously a lot of that happening where I was from and in Saskatchewan and my dad was very good friends with lots of uh uh, bush operators, guys that flew up there. They, I mean, they stayed up there their entire lives, and these guys were, they're legendary, right? They're all in these Hall of Fames in Canada. My dad's in the Hall of Fame up there, by the way. But, um, you know, so he was friends with all those guys, and, and I think he didn't want me to do that because he was scared I wouldn't do so well doing that. In other words, it was dangerous, you know? Like, there's a lot, of, you were making lots of judgment calls when you're 18, 19 years old, and sometimes those judgments didn't go in the right direction. So whether or not you're going to live to fly the next day was, and I don't think he wanted to worry about that. He kind of wanted to be a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, catered in terms of, you know, the safety element and the teaching and stuff like that. He didn't get an opportunity to have that in his flying career because he was not able to join the Air Force because he had a medical uh, limitation, not a serious one at the time. It was one that prohibited him from going in the military. So I think he kind of was hoping that perhaps I would get that opportunity since he didn't. Not that I, you know, it was something he was stuck on. It was just something he thought, man, if I could do it again, you should give that a try. And so really when you obviously see military airplanes flying around, there's like a massive amount of cool factor associated with it, right? So who doesn't want to see, get, get into something that can do the, the stuff that an F-18, F-16, F-15 can do? Um, and so that was, uh, that was, you know, a big part of the motivation. And then later on, I, uh, you know, I saw a lot of, there was a lot of air shows at the time. Um, and so when you go to air shows, you know, the purpose of an air show is to entertain, but it's also behind the scenes to spark interest in kids a lot of times, and I think it does a very good job of doing that. Do you remember any of those early air shows? Yeah, I do. I mean, I went with a bunch of my friends, and um, we were like 17, 18 years old. We were in a Westphalia Volkswagen van, and we went down there, and it was kind of real hippie-ish, you know, like not real sanitary uh, in any way, and I'm lucky to survive it. But one of the big takeaways from it was like the snowbirds flew there and I, I told my friends I go I'm gonna do that and they're like yeah whatever man and then you know obviously life has a way of maybe if you work hard at it you get where you, want, you get where you want to go what were they flying do you remember uh, the snowbirds have always flown the CT114 Canadair Tudor always so, I didn't know that always yeah and it's kind of, and and so this is the thing right so you, they made it's difficult to change platforms in a demo team um but and also for other reasons logistics cost and things like that you know the air force in canada doesn't have the budget that say for example the united states navy or air force has you know um it's just the population's like one tenth almost right so you can imagine one tenth of the budget so you can't do a whole heck of a lot but they certainly do a lot with very little um the team was like only 21 people when I got onto that, and um, and that included the secretary. Um, and we all had secondary and thirdary and fourth uh, jobs and stuff just to keep the whole thing cooking along. We were in the basement of one of the barracks in the base at Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. There was ton. It was it was a very cool place to be. It's gotten bigger now, and they have a different place, but. Uh, you know, at the time, there's a lot of uh, old posters on the walls and things like that. And we're talking like they were associated with people like Art Scholl, Bill Barber, a lot of the old, um, very, very famous people in the air show biz. And, um, you know, they showed themselves to be capable. The team is, I wouldn't say they're the best, but they can hang in there with some of them and, uh, you know, take it very seriously. 
I've seen them fly once at a Cherry Point at the air show there, and it sure. was really, really cool. There's a lot of airplanes, too, a very big difference. Yeah, from maybe it's a the... nine-plane formation, yeah. right? And we used to do a lot of crazy things. Well, I won't say crazy. Let's just say <laughs> that's a bad thing to say in, in the demo in aviation, business. But yeah. yeah. So we used to do nine-plane takeoffs and nine-plane landings. And so um, and those we had to do them on a 200-foot wide runway. But when you try to fit all those airplanes onto 200 feet of runway, you you, you know, my I was a number nine, so I was on the outside left of the formation for takeoff and landing. My left main was maybe seven to ten feet from the edge if I was in position. So the only choice you have is to be in position, right? So you don't have a lot of slush there. No, you do not. Okay, well, that's awesome. I'm, before we get too far ahead, though, sure. we're talking about the Tudor. So you, I wonder if that day that you saw those airplanes fly, if you ended up, I, we say Bunos for a, I don't know, nose number, serial number, whatever you want to call it for different airplanes. In the Navy, we'd call it a Buno. I, I'm just, the curiosity in my brain makes me wonder if you ended up flying one of the airplanes you saw flying that day later as an, an either an instructor pilot on the Tudor or uh, maybe even on the team. Just yeah, probably. I mean, I, I never really went back and forensically dissected my logbook and seen which ones. But the way the team operated, we um, we went through airplanes very quickly. So it would, it would have been quite... I knew for a fact that I flew one of the airplanes for sure. Um, it's now on a stick at a base, right? Because they get worn out real quick in the demonstration role. But yeah, I mean, we only had a finite amount of airplanes. And, um, and so you know, over a 50 plus year period, you cycle through many airplanes, um, either because you wear them out for maintenance reasons, or um, obviously attrition becomes part of it, unfortunately, and so you lose a a few in practice for whatever reasons. Um, So, you you know, you will filter through a few of the airplanes. But yeah, I mean, that could easily have happened. What's uh, you, you mentioned, uh, obviously, interest in civilian aviation, interest in the military. What specifically about the Royal Canadian Air Force? Because I'm, I'm guessing there's more than one option to fly. You could have flown helicopters. You could have flown a lot of different categories and classes of aircraft, even just in the military in Canada. But why the RCAF? Why did you want to go there? Well, I mean, we don't have a lot. Okay, so here's the thing. We don't have, like, as many disciplines or, uh, you know, like in the U.S., for example, you have the Coast Guard, you have the Navy, you have the Marines, you have the Air Force, you know. And in Canada, the Air Force uh, actually held the Navy side, too. So all of the Navy trainees that flew Sea King helicopters, for example, off of the... Off the um, uh, ships, they 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 went through the same training I went through. It's just that at some point during that, you know, a halfway through the course, 120 hours, or I think the ho- total courses like at the time when I did it was 240 hours, and we had seven courses of approximately 20 students. So, you know, depending on what you wanted to do, you put your wish list in, and uh, depending what the military needed at the time, if they needed a whole stockpile of helicopter pilots, then guess what? You go fly helicopters, and actually, and everybody always, you know. You'll appreciate this. They always go, oh, helicopters, never. But anybody that goes and flies helicopters comes back and goes, that's the most awesome thing I've ever flown. I mean, I think the rule, and I I shouldn't be quoted on this, but I think the rule was, you know, you could fly as low as you could, and, and basically it said skids clear of vegetation. So that meant don't come back with anything hanging from the skids. And okay. So that's fun, uh, but it's also perilous too, right? I mean, you got to be that much more aware. And so the skill sets it took to fly helicopters, I mean, all elements of the mil- every bit of military flying has its challenges. You know, it's not just the guys out there, you know, ripping around in an F-18 or, or something like that. It's guys flying instructing, it's guys flying helicopters, it's guys flying Hercules airplanes that were doing uh, low-altitude parachute extraction systems. Lost some friends doing that. I will say I had a chance to fly in a Griffin when we went to Canada. My brother did as well, and he was smart enough. A couple of years later, he was also in uh, the same organization I was in, Civil Air Patrol, and he, he took a video. And I remember thinking on my flight, man, that was low. But then seeing the video, was a, it was low. It was, it was, it's just a, uh, it's a Bell 412, essentially, helicopter. The yeah. Canadian military operates a, a decent amount of them. And, uh, yeah, it was impressive. Those guys were down in the weeds. We didn't come back with any vegetation, but it was impressive that we did not. Yeah. So really, really great pilots there. Yeah, I went for a ride with Black Hawk Seesaw guys in uh, the desert when we were over there when I was doing stuff there. And um, I thought, I just want to come back from this trip. And, like, because, I mean, I think they were doing everything they normally do. And I'm like, if this is your normal day, then, I mean, you know. It's pretty exhilarating, but it's also pretty right out there on the edge. For so, sure. 
For sure. Let's talk about your path into the military. How did you sure. actually join the Air Force? So, uh, well, I, I decided quickly, 16, 17, you know, you know, just about to graduate high school, and I, I wanted to join the military. Canada, you didn't have to be an officer to be a pilot. Um, you have to be an officer, I should say. Let me correct that. But you don't have to have a degree. So you'd come in on two different programs. One's an officer cadet um, training plan if you didn't have a degree. And if you have a degree, you come in as a direct entry officer. And all it really meant is you get paid an extra $150 a month. That's what it meant, really. Uh, you're a second lieutenant or an officer cadet. So your path generally converged rather quickly in terms of rank um, after you got your wings. Um, so I wanted to do that. And, and when I went to apply, I, I mean, I basically left high school and I went to air crew selection in Toronto, Canada, and I passed. However, I only had a grade 12 education and at that time, aviation being aviation and it's very sinus soil and it's it's approach right it's up and down and up and down well it happened to be very down at that time so they had a surplus of people that had degrees so I wasn't in the queue I mean I passed but I wasn't in the queue because I just didn't have that extra little bit which is you know turned out to be a very good thing so I went back to school and I I went and I got a degree and I took I studied physics and um, I don't know why I did that. It was an interesting decision at the time because definitely my, I think both my parents were surprised at that. And I, I was successful too, which was another big surprise. And so, uh, so then I got out of university and I, you know, once I convocated, I, I basically left my robe on the stage, went back down to the recruiting center and I go, I have, and I, and the same recruiter was still there. Oddly enough, he was kind of one of these guys wanted to stay in his hometown and so he knew, he recognized me. And I would go down there periodically every six to 12 months to just say, hey, don't forget about me. I'm going to school. I just did this. I'm, I'm one year away and this sort of thing, just to keep the coals lit up, you know, and just let him know I was still interested. And he said, oh, yeah, things are lining up. And then oddly enough, aviation being the way aviation was, I got the degree. But at that time, now they didn't have a lot of pilots, so I really didn't need. If it would have been the same situation four years prior I would have got in without the degree but it turned out to be um, a very very good decision at the time and it, you know it's like one of these things that typically happens it's a for you make a decision and then you don't know what the benefits are going to be later on but you and, and so it kind of always goes well this is kind of foolish well it turns out it's not always foolish um, so uh, anyways you know put that degree in your back pocket and maybe we'll use it later on I wasn't sure I would or not at the time but all I was concerned about was getting in the military and that's what the path was and so I entered as a direct entry officer went to boot camp in Chilliwack British Columbia and you know um, we had to do French language training six months um, it wasn't pass fail it was just an attend course in so because Canada is bilingual and the service obviously is bilingual so that's a good idea so I was in, in the most skilled class in French I, I spent six months not learning any French at all really and uh, and then you know off I went into the military and f yeah anyway it's kind of funny because later on you know I ended up living in Montreal for three years so uh, after I left the military so uh, life has a funny way of throwing curveballs at you at that and uh, so anyways, did the French language training and then went to preliminary flying training in Portage La Prairie and we flew, um, it wasn't really training, it was more selection. So the courses tended to be about 30 um, candidates um, and some had flying experience and some didn't. I had a pilot's license at the time and uh, funny thing was on the weekends because I, when I, because I flew tail draggers a lot, I, I spent time when I was 16, 17, towing gliders for the air cadets as a civilian guy and uh because they had no tail play ta uh sorry tailwheel pilots so i and i did that for nothing i wasn't making any money i'd just go and do it because i wanted to gather hours aviation always tends to be like that and so um anyway so on the weekends when i was at preliminary tra uh, selection in portage i was out towing gliders um and some of the instructors from the selection squadron guys were in the gliders and I was <laughs> towing them up so anyways I, I I thought this could really damage me or it could be a good thing but you know just don't screw up right don't do anything silly don't say anything just kind of get out of the airplane and walk away and smile and uh, and that's what I did and so it all worked out fine and then went through different levels of training in, in Canada you'd end up after you're successful there you'd end up in Moose Jaw Saskatchewan which was um 
the number two uh, Canadian Forces Flying Training School. And that's where all of the training happened on jets. And so everybody went there. Helicopter pilots, guys were flying multi-engine at this time, um, or guys that were going to go uh, F-18s or fighters. Um, didn't matter. Everybody went there. And your course sizes were nominally, uh, you know, 30 people. I should say, actually, backing up a little in the selection, it was very, I mean, it was after about four or five weeks there in Portage, you'd lose maybe half the course. They would be gone. There was They called it like Black Sunday or something like that. And then because they came up on a certain portion of the course, pardon me. What usually got folks? Do you happen to remember? Was it academic? Was it medical? No, not so much academics because there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of that emphasis on, 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 um, on academics. It was mostly on, um, you know, flying hands and feet at that time they really wanted i mean we didn't have there, there was no glass cockpits i mean the f-18s were just kind of starting to come in the there were still we were still flying f-104 starfighters uh, uh f-101 voodoos uh f-5s you know those types of airplanes those century series airplanes and um so more hands and feet than anything else and and really looking out the airplane was more important than looking into the airplane and so uh, they really concentrated on that. And as a result, we lost a lot of people. And probably, you know, I mean, it just tends to be that way. It's a bit sad, right? People spend a lot of their time and they get in there and all of a sudden the attrition takes over. But it's the reality. Not everybody can do it. And they, you know, some of those folks found jobs in other places in the military. Some went outside the military and started flying somewhere else and, you know, went on to some very, very uh, fruitful careers. But, um, you know, so back to uh, Moose Jaw, or the Jaw, we called it, uh, you know, so we're going through the course. You had seven or eight cor uh, courses going through, and um, now we're more in training. So they're concentrating more. They want us to, they wanted us to basically learn how to fly, and they wanted to teach us all the intricacies of flying, much like you do in any of these ab initio training programs where you start instrument flying, you're doing formation flying, low-level navigation, um, you know, all those sort of advanced instrument flying, and then you come out of there with your instrument ticket. Um, we would come out with a nominally 230 to 240 hours of jet time on the advanced course, after the advanced course. Ones that stopped and went to helicopters would do about 120 hours or so, 140. Um, and, you know, you could go a little over the hours. There was an allotment, uh, a percentage allotment in each phase. But if you didn't make it through that, you'd get maybe one extra duel, depending on the uh, depending on the phase itself. Like low-level nav used to eat up a lot of the, the folks because it just, you know, you're doing four or five miles a minute navigation. I mean, things are happening quickly. And this is all in the tutor, correct? Yeah, all okay. in the tutor. And so, and the base was huge. I mean, you go in the flight line and there'd be 80 of these things. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And you don't see that anymore, really. I think you probably do in the United States Air Force and in the United States Navy. I know Randolph had a whole pile of airplanes. I mean, I was like super jealous. Here's all these 38s on the ramp. I'm like, are you kidding me? So uh, here we thought we were a gorilla and we weren't. We we're just nothing. Well, not nothing, but, you know, definitely not Just like different that. scale. Just yeah. different scale. So anyways, uh, successful there. And then on to, you know, depending on where you finished in the course, you'd, you'd get plugged into something. And, you know, even if you didn't do an ops tour, you could come back as an instructor. I kind of had my eye on wanting to go into the Snowbirds, onto the demo team. So I thought, well, this is a good path because a couple of guys I knew had done that exact same thing. Um, and that's kind of where the Snowbirds started. They started out with instructor pilots, albeit most of them were previous, um, you know, fighter type guys that had come back to the school to teach. Um, and so that's how that whole squadron kind of started up. And so I kind of was eyeing that up. So I thought, here's my path, right? Like you start to build that path and you go, this is how I'm going to construct my military flying career. Um, and so that's what I did. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I laid out those blocks. It didn't quite go in that direction, but um, it pretty much, you know, with the save for a few little, you know, diversions and things like that, it, it went the way I thought it would go. What do you think of the airplane as a formation flying machine? Um, well, you know, when you're a student, you're just trying to hang on, really. I mean, you don't really, you, you know, there's lots of elements in physics going on when you're flying close formation that nobody really knows about until you've been there. 
so, but as a platform, it was very stable. It wasn't difficult to fly formation, and it was, you know, it didn't tend to, you know, you didn't have to concentrate wholly on controlling the airplane. You were able to, you know, you know, concentrate on the turns and things like that. And, you know, it's very dynamic formation. You know, it's a 3D environment, right? Always changing, always requiring. And, you know, I, and I, oddly enough, I really did, we did fly a, a few of the guys that were helicopter pilots. When they came back and flew formation, um, they were mostly quite good at it. And, um, you know, so they, uh, partially I think because helicopter flying isn't one of these things where you can throw the airplane around, right? Like I've seen a lot of digital guys, you know, that fly even um, fly-by-wire airplanes, you know, like fighters. And they'll be like, oh, man, they're just, you know, I mean spastic, you know, movements in the airplane and the fly-by-wire is working as hard as it can to dampen everything out. But, um, you know, so... It was a good airplane. It was. It wasn't like it was designed for that, but it was designed to be a training aircraft. And so, because of that, it had to hit all of those things. I, you know, instrument platform. It had to be stable on approach, uh, clear hood. Um, it couldn't have any adverse qualities doing aerobatics. Couldn't, you know, spinning. It had to be able to spin and um, erect or inverted, or would you do both? Well, it wouldn't hang. No, we didn't do inverted. Um, uh, mostly because the airplane, you just struggle to keep it inverted. You need a lot of power to keep it upside down. It just wouldn't stay there. And to make it spin and make it spin a little flatter, we had to put strakes on the nose um, as part of the design. So they did that and way back when. I think they discovered that. Otherwise, it would just basically, it was such a good airplane, it just didn't want to be there, right? Well, that's a good thing. I mean, the reason I ask, I know the two, that airplane is roughly analogous to a T-37. And one of the interviews I had a chance to do, someone was talking, but very casually, I might add, about inverted spins in the T-37. Of course, to me, very shocking. We do not, that's a prohibitive maneuver for us in the T-6. Yeah. But in the T-37, it was not. I'm also guessing there's probably a difference in the tail. The T-37, more of that conventional, you have a T-tail in, yeah. the, uh, in the Tudor. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, and I did actually at Edwards get an opportunity to do an inverted flat in the um, in the 37. They brought one out and we, you know, they were very guarded. They said, well, it's really wearing the airplanes out. So I think it was almost prohibited, but not really. Uh, but it does it. And, um, you know, the tail on the Tudor, it turns out, wasn't as strong as it needed to be. And there was a couple of things that happened, particularly on the Snowbirds. They had a couple accidents with the Solos. Um, that were tied to the tail and to the to the actual um, way it's it's fixed to the vertical stab huh? the reinforcements that are on there so uh, yeah I mean it, it, it was a very, to answer your question it was a very good airplane it was side by side seating so you know you're not tandem so the guy can't you could actually physically look at the guy and go he's not breathing right oh. and um, or you just you can tell that he's fixating or she is fixating on something that they don't need to fixate on and they should you can open up their vision a little bit so from that standpoint it lent it itself quite readily to being a good platform to instruct on do you remember a lot of your instructors from that initial phase of training uh oh yeah for sure i mean uh, any good stories any good personalities you remember Ah, uh, yeah, great, uh, really good stories. Um, you know, Dane Aiken was a guy that uh, that instructed me, and he was a he, he was a helicopter pilot. He came from uh, he was a Loach pilot, so he was a low level guy, and uh, a real cool. I mean, just a very good instructor, very good demeanor, and uh, and uh, you know he, um, you know, one of the stories I just remember with him. I was almost done the course, and so um, you know, as you're getting closer to the end, they start to push you a little harder in terms of what you're going to what they want you to see so we were up doing um under what you know in instrument flying we called the bag it was like a shroud that went across the helmet i don't know if they still use that anymore so it was part of the helmet it wasn't actually part yeah, of the yeah there's velcro on your helmet and then so you put this gray ah, gray okay. visor thing and it would limit your upward visibility so you're you're basically trying to see and you'd have to physically you could i mean if you lifted your head up you get to sneak a peek but um you know, anyways, so you got this bag on, and um, we went up and we were doing unusual attitudes, uh, partial panel, so no attitude indicator. And so he would set you up in this thing, and, you know, you'd have some simple things. Okay, airspeed decreasing, altitude increasing, okay, I'm nose high. Or conversely, if the airspeed's increasing and the altitude's decreasing, it's nose low. So, uh, you know, I'm feeling fairly good, and, you know, I'm almost at the end. I can almost see that light. It may not be a train anymore. It's going to be, it's, it is, in fact, the light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, and so he sets me up in, um, in, um, in an unusual attitude, and I basically 
went dyslexic on what I saw. So I thought I saw um, airspeed increasing and altitude decreasing when in fact it was a flip-flop. It was a nose-high attitude, so I responded the way I would respond to a nose high, and you used a turn and slip at the time. I don't even know if those still exist. They do, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, I haven't seen one in any of the airplanes. I've been flying for a while. I fly an old airplane, that's why. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So uh, so, so I thought, oh, hey, man, I'm, I'm going downhill in a hurry here. So I pulled the power back, and I turned to the nearest to the horizon that I thought was the horizon, and all of a sudden the airspeed really started winding down, and the altitude was going up initially, but then it just kind of, stopped going up and I think we started to slide and uh, it took me about 10 or 15 minutes to recover from this thing right so it kept on going up and down and slowly I dampened it out but you know I spent a lot of fuel doing it I mean I was sweating like unbelievable amount of sweat got out of this thing and uh, and Dana said okay um, basically I'm going to kind of show you what you did. And it, what it looked like is, I, you know, I took the bag off, obviously, so I could see. And it was a vertical roll, basically, that just slowed down. And then we just kind of did this. And he said, the only reason I didn't intervene is because I wasn't sure I could actually recover from it. Right. So he thought, I'll let you do it. We'll see what happens here. And if anything, we have a couple of ejection seats we'll get out, which would have been a huge shame because who would have known what, what road I would have went down if we would have bailed out of an airplane. So anyways. What, what a thing to say, though, that an instructor, I know you have a lot more instructional time than I do, but something I've certainly come to learn recently, you always want to give the student rope to learn. Yeah. And the analogy I like to say is, but not enough to hang us or not yeah. enough to hang me. Right. Um, but man, that's a tough thing to do, right? Because you want to let them learn through experience, but by the same token, it can't become unsafe. It can't become questionable in that regard. Right. You know, and it's personal limits, right? And so that, you know, when you're brand new, uh, you know, brand new fresh out of the flying instructor school instructor your your personal limits aren't as healthy as they'll become when you become a standards or um, a pilot or a tester pilot or even just an experienced instructor you know you just open that up a little bit but the secret is to know that at any day someone or something can get in the way and put you in a bad spot and um and you just got to be guarded for that you know i mean there's certain things that you wouldn't say. I remember one time I was flying with a guy, and he was really moving along. I mean, we were really like 200 plus, and we were get we should have been configuring to come in and land. And so he's really moving because he's just he was behind the airplane, obviously. And so, anyways, I, I had mentioned, okay, just watch out for the gear speed. And as soon as I said gear, he thought gear down, and then bam, you know. So I'm like, no. And the gear handle was obviously way out of reach for me, so I couldn't intervene and stop what I had created. And it was, I think, it was definitely I was a major league player in that whole thing but you know once again it's just you know you learn from those experiences and you take them with you and you you kind of just uh, put them in your little toolkit you'll never make that mistake again that's the lesson I've learned well I hope to think I won't but I mean you just never know you know yeah for you sure try your best any uh, so I know at least in our uh, our manner of flying around here at VT10, we do local area stuff, but we like to try to get the students out of the local area. Uh, obviously, Canada shares a border with the United States. Do you get to take the airplanes out of the local area? Maybe even fly internationally, fly oh, to yeah. the U.S. Yeah, yeah. During training? Oh, uh, yeah. During training, uh, we What's don't that? do What's too like? much. Uh, just I mean. You know, at different phases of the, well, student training, you take them on cross country so they can experience other airfields and procedures and all that sort of thing and density of traffic and they don't get so used to flying around one airfield, right? Um, so with the students, you do that. And then the instructors, uh, we would have a quarterly uh, mutual trip that we are allowed to take. And, um, you know, by the end of it, I was, you know, I'd gotten up there to be a two plane lead and then a four plane lead. So we would actually take jets down to like Randolph and spend the weekend at the Augur Inn and have some fun and everything and then fly home and all in the name of training of course and uh, but it was crazy because we were 24 25 years old right 26 I mean I was an older guy I was 27 28 because I did the university I had one guy that was on the wing and, and he uh, he later became like a fighter guy and he's a very competent pilot and very good but he was an officer cadet like I talked about before he didn't have a degree so he got into the military um, and he was extra young too like he was one of these guys that was born like at a you know and he, so he was he was 22 years old and um, and he was an instructor and so we were flying down and so here's this guy he's 22 years old he's barely old enough to get a beer at the Augur Inn right and so uh, 
man, it was just crazy when I think about that. Yeah, but, for sure. So you have a lot of responsibility they bestow on you, um, which is kind of neat. That's what it's supposed to be. I think that's something about the military that's kind of nice is that yeah. you're given a lot of responsibility, and they want to see how you handle it. If you handle it well, you'll probably be given more. Right. If you don't handle it well, you're uh, not going to be getting a lot more. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I have no idea what selection looks like. And what, what I mean by selection is you're done with primary. Well, so the terminology we would use is primary and advanced. Once you're done with advanced flight training, you wing. You've earned your wings, and now you're yeah. going to go on to a fleet aircraft. Is it similar terminology in the Royal Canadian Air Force? Yeah, you have a career. You have a uh, course director who's kind of the guy that, um, or girl, that would shepherd your course through that whole process of going through moose jaw do you stay together as a class the whole class goes yes. through together or okay so for in the navy for example it's very individual if you're i don't know your form buddy you get sick you might continue on through the process and you might wing or select a week two weeks a month before or after them yeah i think that's just because you had so many we we had seven courses i was on 8906 that was my course number um yeah, I know all the guys that were successful that went through. I think we lost one or two people. One of them, I think, was not even due to flying. I think it was a medical thing or something. Um, so, yeah, we went through the entire course there. So we started and we ended together, and then we maintained friendships all the way through that. That's really cool. I was going to say, do you stay in touch with any of those folks? Uh, you do, periodically. A lot of the guys that went, uh, I'll see them every now and then, the ones that went to fly for airlines, you know, Air Canada. I'll see them every now and then, you know, going through the terminal. I'm like, oh, man. You know, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, you know those faces still. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, so, but I'm guessing also you're competing with one another, right? For what spots sure. that are available? Sure. Yeah, okay. I know, but it's an individual competition, right? If you excel at tests, then obviously, and there's other elements of it, officer uh, development and things like that. They they bake in a lot of different things, but the primary weight that they use is how you did. You know, uh, so if you scored points, each test was uh, graded as, um, you know, uh, you know, unsat for you didn't make it or superior. And there's like four or five wickets in between that. So you'd have below average, average, above average and superior. And so you got points for each of those the more points you get, the more you graduate with, the higher you are in the course standing and where you end up in that in that uh, ranking. And so typically, if you want to be an instructor, then you'd be you'd have to come end up somewhere around in the top third, somewhere around, around there. So what were the options for you, and where did you end up going? Well, I ended up instructing, and then, um, uh, you know, the options are whatever you want the options to be, really. I mean, if you, there were some that, some guys that were doing very well, and I want to be a helicopter pilot, what I always wanted to be, or I want to fly Herx, you know, or I want to fly P3, or, um, or it was a CP140, the, the Aurora. Um, I want to fly those, you know, so maybe they want to go live on the East Coast because that's where they're from. You know, everybody has their own reasonings. And so, uh, you know, off they go, right? And depending on where you are in the course, that's where you end up going. And so you, you weave your path. Makes sense. Okay. So did you stay there to continue instructing or is there, there's really no other option, right? That's that it. is, that's the only place. Moose Jaw is the only place, right? Cool. So Can you instruct in the same squadron you were just a student in? Well, you had four flights. You had A, B, C, and D flight. Ah, okay. okay. And so I was in a bandit and B flight bandits. And so I went back to bandits and then, uh, you know, to hang out and fly. What's that transition like mentally and uh, even just training wise to go from being the person who's being evaluated and instructed now you're in the right seat and you're the one evaluating and instructing someone else someone brand new. Uh, it's interesting I mean it's it's different but there's enough leadership in the room especially with the flight commander who's some you know my guy that I had was uh, uh, Mick Loboldis was I mean he's he, he looked like he was way older than he was but he's flown everything and you know at that time, everybody smoked and that sort of thing. So nobody really looked like a health nut, you know what I mean? Nobody was on the exercise cycle every day. It was exactly the opposite. So it was just a different time to live in the Air Force. And so anyways, it, it, but, you know, the transition was the transition was basically you were shepherded through. You had different categories. You were given, like, enough rope to be able to do this. You were given only one or two students, and one student you would take through the entire course. And then you would develop, and then there was different categories of instructors. And so, you know, you always, you know, you kind of always wanted to be considered to be a good instructor. I mean, everybody wants to be considered to be a good pilot, no matter what they're doing. I don't think anybody really wants to be considered to be a bad pilot. But, you know, so you just, you try to do what you can do to make it work. And a lot of mentoring happening and a lot of camaraderie. It's the thing about the military that's so great, right? I mean, it's just, there's a lot of that motivation that's just pulled out of, you know, that 
how you live. You know, the competition may not be there overtly, but it's there. And so everybody kind of wants to have the respect of one another, which is more so what it is. It's just the respect of everyone. Nobody wants to walk in and we go, oh, my God, look at it, here he is. You know, you never want to be responsible for a checklist change, right? That's what we used to say. You're going to hear me ask probably a couple times, highest high, lowest low. So I always like to try to find the corners. As an instructor pilot, obviously, you don't just start out with a bunch of experience. You just want, well, I guess you have experience in the airplane, but now you need to learn as an instructor. So you're in the other seat trying to teach someone else, evaluate them. Is there... Anything that kind of jumps out on either ends of those polar spectrums, you know, an awesome flight, a terrible flight, things that, you know, hey, I really learned about flying from that, and I want to share that lesson with others, or uh, maybe, I don't know, a day that just came together perfectly, a cross-country, a form flight. I, I don't even know what to ask, but I always know the corners are usually where those exciting stories come yeah, from. Yeah, well, I mean, the way I, you know, somebody has asked me that question, I mean, I'd take a look at, it's all in the results, right? Um, and so... Um, you know, one of the unfortunate things about instructing is sometimes some students aren't successful. And um, and so there, that's a very difficult conversation to have. And when you see the end coming, and you know it's coming, and they know it's coming, how do you get through that and just try to preserve somebody's, you know, basically you don't want to break anyone's spirit. And sometimes it's for things completely outside the control. Uh, but it just doesn't appeal to everyone, right? I mean, it just doesn't. And so you can't expect it to either. And that's what that whole training process is, is all about. So on the low side, you know, having to deal with that, and it happened on occasion. Um, and the more experience you got as an instructor, you know, the more you elevated in categories, the more difficult some of the students that you dealt with were, you know, their difficulties became your difficulties in terms of trying to get them where they needed to be. Conversely, on the higher side, getting someone over that hump right later on when I was it happened later on not so much in instructing but I'll just kind of jump ahead a little bit but you know I was flying this is after I ended up in Cold Lake and doing testing and stuff but I was also flying tutors up there because we use tutors as kind of a, a chase aircraft um, and so anyways one of the guys that I knew, he was a student in, in Moose Jaw when I was on the Snowbird team. He, he he was quite a guy. I mean, he was a big personality, big character. He was up on the F-18 course, and he was going through, and he was really struggling with G. Um, even though he was wearing a G suit, um, they still had to pass a G awareness training, or the G training, I think we call it, because it used to be awareness training, and then we had somebody that just went through it, and then he was lost in a, in a G lock incident. So they said, hey, we need to make this mandatory and you have to pass this because we don't want to cross that bridge again. So anyways, he was struggling with this and the profiles were really aggressive. And so, you know, he, I, because in the, in the, I was a solo on the Snowbird, so I never flew, flew with a G-suit, much like the Blues don't either. Um, I don't know how many people realize that, but they don't. And let me tell you from experience, they can really rack on some G and um, and keep it for a while uh, but anyway so you start to get good at it and G tolerance is very perishable like it's you know you got to keep on doing it you know this right and so anyways um, this chap was really struggling with it and he'd go to the G he tried three times and failed and they said this is the last time and so anyways they called up to over at the test squadron and said hey see if Rooster wants to come over and fly with him and you know, we'll put together a program and we'll give it to him and then he can go up and try to give him some tips and techniques on how to work on his G straining. Because a tutor, oddly enough, could really put some G on very quickly. Like you could turn it and, and you know, just physically put it to 7G like in a heartbeat. Conversely, you could push on it and get back to minus 2.5, minus 3. So, I mean, it was a real, um, I mean, a real workout. And so I put him in the airplane. We, we looked at the profile. I didn't agree with it not as much because it was made by doctors not pilots so we modified it a little bit but we touched all the high points so we could at least say we used what the recipe they gave us and um and then took him out and he went out and we did um you know six or seven flights and we just worked him hard and uh you know i just made him sit there and i said this is what you do this is what you do made him fly in his fly in the winter flying gear which so he's sweating i mean this is i mean it was a bit like i could probably be charged for what I did to him but anyways uh, he went off to Toronto and he passed right and so the agreement we made is that as soon as we say he's good to go you got to get him to Toronto because we want all of what we've taught him to be fresh in his mind and he actually went out there and I mean he didn't just pass but he like I think he recorded more G than anybody 
uh, ever, you know, that had come through in the same profile. So, it, you know, that was one of those times when you take somebody that needed to cross a bridge and equally at the same time, even, you know, back to the moose jaw with students, if you cross a bridge with somebody, then the, all of a sudden that light bulb came on. It's very rewarding. I mean, it's part of instructing that you all... I really enjoyed anyways over the years is really seeing people, you know, trying to get them interested in it, trying to see what the problem was, trying to fix it. Um, and then, you know, with, uh, with some luck and, and, and that, you know, maybe it'd be successful. For sure. That, and, uh, I think that's such a great perspective and, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of times students, when they see us as instructors, they think and it's not an adversary relationship, but maybe they realize we're the ones holding the standard, holding them to account. You know, we're the ones to teach them, but also have to be the other one, like you said, have that uncomfortable conversation. So, I don't know. I guess I'd say number one, if any of my students are listening, you should be studying. So stop listening to this. But number two, <laughs> only kidding. Uh, but but number two, the people on the other side of the table, the people in the front cockpit, back cockpit, whatever it might be, that those of us that are instructing you want you to succeed. Yeah. You have to want to succeed, but right. we also want you to succeed. And it is the greatest feeling in the world when. I've said it three different ways, but the fourth way it gets through and you can tell. And for me, I'm either maybe looking in the mirror at the student behind me or looking at the back of their head in the front and that light bulb, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Like I'm not doing anything, but I'm getting through to someone else. Their hands maybe are on the controls or they're the one making the radio call. They finally have the situational awareness to realize you, you can see it build and it's just the greatest feeling ever. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, and that's exactly it. And you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, you see them at the graduation, then you see them go on and it's almost like, hey, that I was a big, it's like your teachers think of you when you went to school, I'm sure. You know, they, I remember you and, and you always wanted to do that. I had teachers like that. And they, you know, they're always interested in how you do in life, right? Because you, basically you're their first customer, really, in terms of training and so you know, it's a, it's a neat way to see people go on. So next up, obviously, I think the greatest thing, so I know at least on the Air Force side, Air Force side, they call it a FAPE. Oh, gosh, I'm blanking on the term. Uh, cell grad, selectively retained graduate. I think that's the Navy, Marine Corps t uh, title for it. But I think one of the really great things, leaving that tour that that, the number one, you got a lot of great hours, you're an instructor, you have a lot of essay that you wouldn't otherwise have as a student. But generally, there's a little bit different selection process for the fleet airframe leaving that tour, i.e., okay, now you have this experience, maybe you're going to have a better chance to compete for fighters or wherever else you might, you might want to go. What's it look like in Canada, and where'd you go next after that tour? So it is similar to that. I mean, you, you start to put your wish, lit in, wish list, I should say. Um, so you'll typically do two tours, ops, and then one ground. That's kind of the way it goes. So there's about nine years right there. So, if, you know, a, an operational tour or fleet tour, as you say, is uh, about three years, maybe four, sometimes a little longer, but that's for exceptional circumstances. Um, but basically, you put your wish list in, you have a career manager. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're in training or you're in fighters or whatever, you have somebody that looks at you periodically, not with a lot of scrutiny or anything like that, but to try to what they call manage and or mangle we used to call them manglers too but um you know so they're there to do that and facilitate the, that process and so you just kind of say i want to do this and f some of the so the next thing i did was um you know just at the end of my instructing uh instructing tour i was in a car accident and i got kind of really badly injured and um and so i was recovering from that and they weren't sure what i was going to do i um, it was a fairly significant injury. I lost a little bit of vision. It progressively came back. I, my finger wouldn't bend anymore like it was fixed. It was a pretty nasty accident. So anyways, there was, ah, what are we going to do with you? Can you fly high performance? Well, I could. I went up and I got cleared back to fly with a flight surgeon who was also a Hornet pilot, oddly enough. Uh, so he was in a really, really good position to be able to sit with me in the airplane and go and make sure that I, you know, because uh, I had a pretty bad head injury too, which they were concerned about. Um, so anyways, we went up and flew and he said, yeah, you can fly anything. So I have a letter in my logbook that's still there from the military says you're good to fly anything. So I, uh, and then they said, well, what do you want to do? And, and, and a lot of people in, in the Canadian Air Force, because we don't have, like in the U.S. Air Force, we don't have great places like Pensacola. And I know some people are going to say, oh, Pensacola, you know, that's not a great place or or Miramar or uh, Randolph, you know, and no, we had Cold Lake, Moose Jaw, 
and um, Bagotville and Trenton, and none of these are like no, you know, Trent. Yeah, Trenton's kind of nice, but it's not Toronto know. or anything. Yeah, it's not. You're not in a in a <laughs> you know in a very desirable place. Let's say. Anyway, so there are some desirable places. One of them was Comox, British Columbia, and so we did search and rescue out of there, and we did um, flying buffalo aircraft to have them buffaloes. And so I remember the commandant called me in and goes, hey, Rooster, you know, so here's the deal. We, you know, you did all this and this, we, would you like to go there? And I said, no, I'd, I'd really like to complete my instructing crew, you know, duty and get my, elevate to my uh, A2 category of instructing. I just felt that was important to have in my log book for whatever reason. It was just, you know, when you come back from an injury and stuff, you kind of want to pick up where you left off. And so that was one of my mandates that I had personal mandates. And so I did that and then, Finally, they came in and they say, hey, we have another opportunity, and it's down at Tinker Air Force Base. And I'm like, flying the E-3, and they said, yeah. And I go, well, can you be an aircraft commander? And and uh, they said, well, that might change, but right now you can't. And I'm like, well, I'm not really interested in not being an aircraft commander. I just, like, I'm going to sit in the right chair all the time and fly as a co-pilot. I mean, yeah, I'm out of country, but anyways... So I decided, I talked to a friend of mine that had gone down there, and he said, no, you know what, I think we're moving in the direction I think it's going to happen. And sure enough, I went down there, and, and, and sure enough, we could become aircraft commanders. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, did, I did it in pretty much amount of time that I wanted to. In less than a year and a half, I was out in the left chair of a Boeing 707 with 40 people in the back. I'm like, how did I end up here? And then, um, you know, because it was, it was kind of fun, you know. Like, I mean, the flying isn't real fun, but there was something about the mission and the squadron life and every. I mean, everything has its silver lining. Everything has a good part to it. And, and you know, and I just really enjoyed that element of it because we literally hung out all the time. The squadron was either deployed or the squadron wasn't deployed. And if the squadron wasn't deployed, some may be deployed somewhere, but most of us were hanging around, so we all hung out together. So it was a real close-knit group, and I really enjoyed it, and I managed to, I went up to instructor pilot on it. I mean, I really I went great. I mean, I spent four or five years, almost five actually, it was four and change, I think, and I was flying all the time. I mean, all the time. I went away as much as I could. I went in, after I got my training done, I went into the current ops. They call it scheduling. They still call it that now? Yeah, still, we call it skeds on the Navy yeah, side, but yeah, scheduling. Yeah. Yep. I went in and I said, I want to be gone. And four days later, I was in Turkey. Like, for real. I mean, okay, you're going to be gone. You know, Not everybody wants to be gone like you. So I was gone. And then that, that set up a rotation. And I wasn't married at the time or anything. I was a single guy. So, hey, who cares, right? And so I'm just going all over the place flying. And like I said, the flying wasn't exciting, but there's certain elements that are exciting. Air refueling is exciting. Um, I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care if they're a fighter guy or a heavy guy or whatever. Air refueling is exciting. And air refueling at night is really exciting. you know. And so you did a lot of this stuff, and then there's a lot of responsibility laid on you, and you're doing real stuff. Um, things that you can't really chat about all that much most of the time, but you know that when stuff is being put on the news, you're living it. Broadly speaking, what does the E-3 do? What's the mission set that the E-3 does for the Air Force? Uh, yeah, it's a, well, the E-3 is like an airborne warning and control system. It's, an, it's, it's uh, what the Hawkeye does in the Navy. Um, it's a, it's a, basically, it, it's setting all the chess piece, pieces. It has the weapons directors on it. Um, they're able to surveil the, the battle space. And um, really, the pilots up front are just putting the airplane where they want the airplane to be. That's all we're really doing. And we've got the big, huge radar on top, and, um, and we can look a long way. And so it's a critical, it's a, it's a high-valued asset. It's very important in the battle, battle space. And so, you know, we, anytime something happened, we would have to go there, you know. And so that meant you always, every Christmas, you were going somewhere, it seemed. And... You know, so I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was a great experience. And, um, you know, older airplane, a lot of people learned um, a lot about crew resource management and how to work with a team, uh, front and back of the airplane. And there's a lot of decisions that are being made. And, again, you're this young guy. You're 30, 31, 32 years old maybe, and you're out there, you know, leading this group of people and there's some you know a lot of people are depending on you was there a hard was this uh i know a lot of times when folks do exchange tours it's pretty coveted was it a hard battle for you to get that spot to get to fly with the air force not well 
perhaps I, I think there was because at first you couldn't be a left seat or an aircraft commander I think you know some people weren't that interested in it especially on the transport group right they said well wait a minute I'm flying left seat on C-130s or on Airbuses or on our own 707s that we had uh, that were air refueling um, you know why would I go somewhere where I can't do that for whatever reason it was more of a legality issue than it was a competency issue and so anyways it wasn't as coveted as it probably became when that wasn't the case when it changed all of a sudden there was a lot of elbows sharpening up and people trying to get to the front of the line and saying hey I want to do that right um, and so uh, you know it was important at that time to set a very good example um, and we had a component a Canadian component there it was a NORAD duty so we had about 40 of uh, varying crew positions that were there so it wasn't an individual thing but it was more individual in terms of the crew position you know, we only had two, I think it was two or three, two at the most uh, pilots from Canada on there, maybe three, it depended on the timings. So, you know, you're you're a very, you know, small fish in a big pond. And, uh, and so you had to carry yourself that way and you had to make sure you set a good example because you're representing your country, um, you know, not just yourself, your country, right? And the capabilities of the Air Force and all that good stuff. So you always keep that in the back of your mind. You don't want to embarrass that. Talked about broadly speaking. Broadly speaking, what are some big differences between the way the U.S. Air Force operates and the Royal Canadian Air Force operates? Because you, at this point, had a bit of flavor of both. Yeah, uh, I would say, if, uh, having flown a lot with different, the Canadian Air Force is more aligned with the Navy um, in terms of if it doesn't say you can do it, it, you know, it doesn't have to say you can do it for you to do it you know what I mean like I mean if you don't break any rules of the airplane aircraft limitations or anything like that or rules broad rules low flying whatever it doesn't mean you can't do it like I can go out and do a three-point roll in a jet doesn't tell me anywhere in the books that I how to do it but I could do it and we did do it um, you know but it just it was building skill sets and that was one of the big big um, differences between what I thought in the United States Air Force and the Canadian Air Force at the time it didn't transition to the RCAF until after I had left really but which is a bit of a shame because I would have liked it um, but it, it you know we we didn't want to limit people to um, we always wanted people to think outside the box. We thought it was important for people to grow. Now, we don't want you to go out there and be negligent, break rules, and, you know, be a, a you know, just a, a delinquent. But, uh, but th we wanted you to be able to exercise some judgment and be able to grow. In the Air Force, and I think for a very honest reason, I think it's just so big right um it's like we i was we are like the little corner store and the u.s air force is like the the walmart right it's the big it is huge and so to control that and make sure you have a grip on that you have to set boundaries and unfortunately the boundaries you set may limit people to what they do in an airplane uh, it's all for good reasons and you know in the, at the end of the day certainly one of the most skilled air forces i'll tell you that i mean unbelievable like when you saw what could come together um it's 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 really impressive you talked yeah. about uh tanking flying the airplane behind and uh, touching another airplane with your airplane yeah. i've done it one time in a helicopter in a 53 behind a marine kc-130 i uh, didn't even get to get gas we just did dry plugs for my initial three and then that's probably the only three i'll ever do in a helicopter the reason i mentioned that is Every aircraft flies differently behind a tanker. In fact, right. the specific tankers have different characteristics. Sure. The E3, not only is it a 707, which is just a big darn airplane in general, but you have uh, that big old uh, spaceship on the yeah. back there, too. What uh, what was it like flying it behind other tanker? And then what was it like flying behind different tankers? And uh, I'm, you said day, night. I know nothing about it. I'm guessing there's lineup lines I think you have to fly up right. underneath. Yeah, just yeah. talk us through it. So we're a receiver, so, you know, it was an Air Force um, putting the boom into the uh, into the receptacle on the airplane um yeah the well the the dish on top of the airplane was always meant to be a neutral lifting body if you will um it was not supposed to be it wouldn't cause adverse handling now i knowing now what i know about flight testing and stuff i mean you know uh, vmcg and things like that would probably be impacted for i never gone back and actually taken a look at a legacy airplane and compared it to that installation 
but I'm sure it impacted it in some way. Um, but tanking, for example, was, you know, the differences in airplanes. The 135 was typically, the KC-135 was kind of the one we always tanked behind. Um, they'd be autopilot on. There was a time when they were autopilot off, and that made it a little bit uh, challenging. Um, the tracks that you're in, if you're on a straight line track, that's different than an anchor track. So you're, you know, where you're turning. The big thing on a large airplane taking gas is you're taking a lot of gas, right? You're you're changing the characteristics of the airplane. The tanking aircraft is lightening up and you're getting way heavy. So you know, and how the flight engineer moves that fuel around can really make how the airplane handles different. So you just have to really take it and be smooth on the controls. And you have four engines that are there and. You know, I remember when I was first learning it in the um, in the simulator, there was this chap in Tinker. He was like this old guy, Chuck Planer, that had flew EC-121s back in the day, right? And then he flew E-3s when they first came in. And um, anyway, so he was, here's how you tank, right? And they could do it in the sim. The sim was terrible, right? It was, it was a typical sim. It barely kind of represented what the airplane flew like. But if you could fly air tanking in the sim, you could fly it in anything. So anyways, I was just struggling and, you know, I had the control wheel was all cockeyed and the throttles were all out of shape. I mean, I was just standing on the rudder pedal. I mean, I was struggling big time. And he goes, hang on a second, you know, Bobby, just let me get in here. And he's in, in between the pedestal behind. So he's kind of leaning forward with his left hand on the control wheel. And he's got his right hand on the throttle quadrant. And he's leaning forward and looking up kind of in the sim. And he's kink into the, like, right away i don't know if he could make the sim do that but i'm trusting it was just pure skill and i remember at the time going holy crap how does he do that and then i thought it can't be that hard if chuck planer can do it like that i can do it and then so that became my that's i and and really it's typical formation flying small movements anticipate what's coming up next and try to not don't be reactionary try to anticipate and if you do that and you and you don't make any big movements your life will typically be okay. And uh, and so that's kind of how that all went. It was just very challenging, but I think it it kind of helped me later on in formation flying. Was it a split throttle situation where you're keeping two of the engines essentially parked at a power setting and then maybe manipulating the other two? Or how did, how did yeah, you do Yeah, you'd kind of, well, to, to minimize the, uh, you know, the adverse yaw that the outboards would introduce, you'd try to fly primarily on the inboards. But when you're taking on so much gas, at the end of this whole thing, all of them are up at the forward bit, so it's the differences in the thrust, just output of each engine. And then we kind of sometimes maybe toboggan down a little bit if we needed to catch a little bit more gas before we jumped off the tanker, depending on what we're trying to do. So you had some ingenious ways of doing things. But really, it, it just, at first it was, a you know, it's like anything else in flying. All of a sudden the light bulb comes on and it's like, I got it. And then when you go to be an instructor, you have to show boom limits. So you have to go out to the outsides of the boom um, on both the KC-10 and on the KC-135. KC-10 is like coming underneath a city, right? It's like the, I mean, you come underneath this thing. And, and actually you had asked about, you know, does that dish play into it at all? And we were all convinced that the center engine, um, was actually kind of canted down a little bit, it seemed, and it was kind of making the airplane a little squirrely, but nobody really knew that for sure. We just kind of, it was like one of those little excuses where it was, oh yeah, it's KC-10, you know. But you'd literally go underneath the airplane, and you know, 135, the boom operator's laying on his stomach, and you know, in this boom pod thing, and in the KC-135, he's sitting in like a lazy boy, and he's kind of like, you know, having a cup of coffee and he's controlling this this boom thing. So you're, it's completely different. Really. Two very different yeah. setups. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. It's, uh, I can't remember if it's an E3 or an E8, but there's a pretty famous video of a disconnect that looks very, very violent. The breakaway. The breakaway. Yeah. Do you know yeah. anything about that story? I or? don't know. I I I think it was a note. That was a NATO E3. I think. I think it was. It yeah. It was a NATO E3 uh, from GK um, Galen Kirshen. Um and so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that was a practice breakaway, but it certainly looked like they porpoised up quite a bit and they got very close to the airplane. So that was a really, like, wow. I, the only incident I had refueling, and we were actually flying out of Gallenkirch and we were doing some operations down in the Baltic, um, like real stuff. And so um, we were tanking and we came behind the 135 and the boom was, I don't know if the boom was, what was going on with the boom, but it was really 
like moving around a lot it never really because you come into pre-contact stable and then they go clear to contact and um and so it was just moving a little bit and i go man is it just me or is that boom moving a lot and, and then they say well no it should be okay and then we um we ended it, it ended up striking our refueling door and um i think it knocked it off i can't remember now but it was there was a big buzzing noise and of course we never knocked off the trip right we're like oh yeah well the airplane's flying okay so let's keep on trucking and uh so we did wow and, uh, but yeah how to get it done well like you said real world stuff it kind of matters a little bit more so it does yeah so obviously the thing about the e3 you mentioned you know where important things in the world are happening is where the e3 is going to be you're going to be moving around a lot where did you go and kind of what was that mission set like um so typically at the time so we're talking mid 90s now um so kind of in the middle of the uh, Gulf War and stuff like that, and Saddam is doing his thing. Um, we were there to guard out the no-fly zone. So we would operate Southern Watch, which is out of um, Prince Sultan Air Force Base. It used to be out of Riyadh, and then they moved it. And then on the Northern Watch, we were flying out of Incirlik Air Force Base in Turkey. And then, um, uh, so that's what we did over there. And then we had an additional mission. We did counter-drug operations too there. It's no big secret that the airplane did that, and it was suited very well to do that. So that was kind of your your um, reward debt because that was in Panama, and you know it was at Howard Air Force Base, and so it was very pleasant. What was Howard like? I've heard about it, but not a whole lot. I know it's obviously I don't believe it exists anymore. If it does, we don't go there. But well, yeah, it was a good time. You always want to be somewhere where they shut the base down and you have a good DO because the DO goes, okay, let's go shopping. You go to because the, they don't take any of the stuff home typically, right? They just kind of either distribute it to the locals or I don't know what. Anyways, we got a bunch of stuff. You oh, know, really? Other ones and everything. But, uh, but Howard was a I good deal. That was where people but, wanted to go. Yeah. And so you're living on this great base and, you know, um, the, it was one runway and um, there was one precision approach in. Uh, so you had to circle depending on the wind. And so in a 707, circling was not easy. And it rained there all the bloody time. It's a lot like Mobile. Um, Mobile it just seems like it rains, like it's sunny, and then all of a sudden it's raining. And it's raining a lot. And that's what it typically was like down there. Uh, Howard was a great place. I mean, I just just really loved going there. So at the time, you know, you just, you're just living this life, you know, and you go, okay, this is normal. Okay, well, Rooster, one thing before we leave the E3. Actually, this isn't even an E3 thing. This is uh, back when you were as a instructor pilot. Uh, your call sign. What's your call sign? I guess I already asked you that or I told – I've already called you by your call sign, but what's the, what's the story behind Rooster? So, yeah, you don't, you don't get to choose your call signs, right? And if you try to resist a call sign, um, it'll, it sticks even more. So if you get a call sign that's reasonable, you just, okay, I can live with that. You know, I don't want to be called shaky or something like that or, you know, you suck or acronyms are always the good ones because there's usually profanity hidden in there yeah and, and it's usually I've, more I've insulting. got some really good ones you probably don't want to talk about them. <laughs> some really good ones but um anyways so rooster came my we were you know i was we had a group of guys and like i said before we were all young guys flying around in these airplanes and having fun and everything and so we were up and uh went somewhere and everybody's looking looking for me i didn't show up from the night before in the morning and I wasn't doing anything, you know, I just wasn't showing up. And uh, so when they like, went up to the front desk, hey, did this guy check out, you know, and she goes, well, who is it? And well, it's this guy. And he, you know, you're not really sure if you like him or you don't like him, or he's kind of got this cow look going, but he's kind of walking, he's got this strut, kind of like a rooster, and that was it. And she goes, oh, I know that guy's right over there. And so <laughs> she pointed right at me. So anyways, that was it, boom. So it was very innocent, right? So that's that's how that all went down. Does it ever, I mean, I think for us, a lot of times you get a call sign, it sticks. Is this something you can be renamed if you do maybe something dumb or, you know, something well, you, else later in your career? Yeah, you, I mean, call sign renaming always happen. But, I mean, there, it's hard to make something stick. We had one guy we called Jackass, and he's like, you'll never make that stick, and it stuck. <laughs> Challenge he's still, accepted. He's still, he's still Jackass. He's still Jackass. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, that wasn't you, though, so that's good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, so you're you're flying the E3. Obviously, again, you're Royal Canadian Air Force pilot, but you're in the U.S. Small contingent, like you mentioned, of uh, 
of folks down here in the U.S., but what does it look like for your next assignment? Because you're competing with everyone, I'm guessing, back home. I say competing, big air quotes, right? Everyone wants certain places to go. Right. But you're not there. You're not, I mean, you observe, we would call it a fit rep, an observe fitness report. Um, but even then, you're in a different country. You're flying a different airplane. I'm guessing Canada doesn't have a fleet of E3s flying no. around, right? No. What was that like? Was it a challenge to get to go where you wanted to go next? Because I know where you went next, but yeah. what was that, what it, was that process like? Well, it was. I mean, but and they did the equivalent of a fit rep or, uh, uh, you know, you do a uh, Eval. P, PER, it's called okay. Personal Evaluation Report. And so it's done by, you know, I was highlighted. I thing about that tour was you're working a lot with elements of the of Canadian military that were in higher headquarter taskings. So we had like, you know, folks down in Tyndall and your name kind of spreads around a little bit. And one of the things that happened to me when I was flying E3 is I had an engine failure on takeoff on the, you know, it just blew up basically the engine on one of our just a normal takeoff hot day. We we're going out to do some stuff. And uh, the engine, blew, it was it was not uncontained, but it wasn't contained. Like, so it, it was a very violent engine failure. It was a turbine blade. That, so when you're flying an E3, and I was working in the safety office at the time um, as a Canadian guy. So I would go to every morning, you go to the stand-up briefing with the uh, general, right? It was a general that was in there. And then the, he had his whole head, uh, office, head office staff there, ops group commanders and all that. And uh, so anyways, I was used to what they were doing. And so I, I know how much exposure something like that would get. There's only just north 30 of these things. So they're a high-valued asset. There's not that many. And we, they had lost one in Elmendorf uh, quite a few years back. Uh, Pretty famous, uh, very tragic story. Yeah, it was a very tragic accident. And, you know, we had a Canadian fellow that was on there. There was Canadian people lost on there. I was at Elmendorf, and um, if I recall, that was geese on takeoff, correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. it's a flock of birds. Yeah, and it's just one of those things where the worst of the worst of the worst happened at the worst possible time. So critical phase of flight on takeoff on the runway, um, they took all these geese in one engine and went out real quick, and but the other one was still producing thrust, and so they elected to keep on going, and they were just past um, decision speed or V1, we called it. And, um, and so they committed to fly, and then just after rotation, the other en engine failed. And so now you have two out on one side, and you're just, you know, you're, you're doomed. And the story I heard was, pardon me, when they recreated or tried to fly the exact same scenario in the simulator uh, in Seattle, the, uh, the test pilots... Nobody lasted as long as the crew did in Elmendorf. Nobody. So those guys hung on to that airplane. They did everything they possibly could do, and unfortunately it didn't end well. So that's always in the back of your mind. So, um, you know, go fast forward now, so I'm taking off, and um, it just, you know, you don't you don't plan these things, right? I mean, obviously you don't. Um, so you're just taking off, and all of a sudden there's a big boom, and um, the airplane yawed to uh, to the right so we knew that we'd lost something on the right the, F the flight engineer came in immediately and was getting ready to do stuff so he just kind of pushed his hands away and i said just leave everything alone let's get to the airplane cleaned up but i want to check for fire because i wasn't sure we were losing gas and um and we had a lot of gas on that airplane on that particular day and it was a hot day too so take off performance I and mean, we, were, we were good to go but we were on the edge right it wasn't perfect it was like this time of year in tinker and um, anyways, we got airborne, we cleaned up the airplane, we got some air under our butts, and then we, you know, we went out to the, uh, I knew we were going to have to dump gas to come back because we were way over max landing weight. And so we just settled in there and everybody calmed down and then we went through all the steps. And of course, you had a SOF. You, you familiar with it's soft an Air Force thing, yeah, supervisor flying. That's yeah. not a Navy thing. So you had the soft on the ground and, you know, we're going through the data and running the numbers. And so I sent it down to the SOF. I said, double check our work. And, you know, he kind of said, well, you don't need to do that, Rooster. And I'm like, but I want to, just because. It just makes me feel better that there's people involved. And so all of these, um, so all of the ops group got together in the room. They didn't know how this was going to end up. And we went down and we came back and landed. Everything was fine. We took care of the emergency. Everybody worked great together. And, um, you know, um, I remember sitting in the cockpit just after we, we taxied in. We had a... Um, a pen, not a pen, it was like a, a gated area with a high fence with security towers in it for the E3s. If you ever go to Tinker, you'll see that. Um, and you had to have permission to come in and go out airplane-wise. 
So anyways, we get permit, we, we taxi in, come into the gate. We've got this air engine that's, we don't even know what it looks like because we're still on the airplane. Taxi in, park, sitting on the airplane doing the rest of the book work and stuff like that and just kind of collect our thoughts and, you know, hey, how do we think we all did, you know? If you, you know, and I said to the guys, I said, hey, if you have any, just everybody write down anything, right? And I'm not say, I'm saying good or bad, okay, because we've got we to talk about this and we want to, you know, how did we do? This hadn't happened in a long time, uh, an in-flight shutdown. And one that was, you know, not even an, an elected shutdown. This was the engine failed. It blew up. So anyways, we were sitting in there, and this all of a sudden, this a couple, a colonel and a general got on the airplane. The one general, I recognized him. Hey, sir, how's it going? He goes, well, you tell me. And uh, and he goes, I just want to show you this. And he, they had already been up to the tailpipe of the airplane, and they, they came back with a handful of um, little bits from, like, the turbine blade, I guess it was. And he said, just pick a souvenir. He goes, yeah. so, you know. Anyways, that's how that all went. So look, I got some attention because of that, and um, and so that wasn't a bad thing. And so at least now they're trying. They're saying, "Oh, we want you to again. We want you to promote." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I don't. I kind of like where I'm at right now. I want to stay a captain. Do what I'm doing. Let my life take the trajectory that I had planned for it." And um, you know, at that time, I kind of knew that I was getting coming up at the end of the tour, and I would have to to um, you know make some elections. And so what I was trying to do was come back and um, I would made a decision I was going to try to go to F-18s or I was going to try to go to the Snowbirds. Um, if you try to go to the Snowbirds and you're unsuccessful going to the Snowbirds, you lose control of your life. So it is a bit of a gamble. Um, it's not like you can go do that and then go, oh, I want my cake and eat it too. And then, I'll, oh, I'll go take that path now because that didn't work out. No, you made that election. Now we're going to, you are at our whim. So there's a bit of a risk there. So, you know, kind of pointing towards your question you do kind of lose a little bit of your the way that you can navigate by doing that but that's where you went you did go to the snowbirds yeah but you, you, but you, you try out for the snowbirds in canada so it's not like you get selected to go to the snowbirds of course of course you, you put a letter in and then they go mm, does anybody know this guy and and you know and obviously at the time i knew quite a few people and so they knew me and they said yeah they take eight uh take eight for tryouts and they take four on the team so you have a 50-50 chance. Of so it's a four-person turnover every year? At that time it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's traded a little bit. Depends on the times and things like that. You know, if we're, you know, if we are suffering for, say, F-18 guys and we need to keep people in squadron, maybe you don't get as many on the turnover. We keep the people in the squadron. Some other teams are like that. I think the Italians do that. Um, well, I think that's a big strength to the, the, the Snowbirds is that it's not just F-18 or not just fast jet pilots. There are helicopter pilots on the team. Everyone. Yeah, it's a, it's Everyone. a little bit of a, a little bit of everything as opposed yeah. to the U.S. Navy, obviously the Blues. You're going to have flown a Hornet of some flavor before going there, but that's the only thing. It's not like C-130 guys exactly. fly the Hornet there. Right. So. Yeah, we didn't, you know, we're just not big enough to enjoy that luxury. Indeed, indeed. So what was that tryout process like? Can you kind of walk us through it? Yeah, so, well, you send your letter off, and then if you get a tryout... Um, you would show up uh, kind of like in October and you get a quick refresh on the airplane um, just with the flying instructor school in Moose Jaw and they get you back your basically your ticket on the airplane so your instrument ticket and your and your um, clear hood ticket we called it uh, captaincy check and um, so everybody does that and some guys are doing if you're coming from helos you would maybe take a little longer because you'd been away from fixed wing for that much longer. So, you know, it may take a little while. Anyhow, so you go do that, and then the tryouts start, and you come in, and it's, everybody's nice to you for about five minutes, and then it's not nice, right? It's two to three trips a day, um, no more than an hour at a time. You start off in two planes, and then you go to four planes, uh, and once you've made the team and you look back and you take part in some tryouts, you understand why they move people around the way they do. But at the time, you don't know. You don't know anything. What you know is, and everybody stays the entire duration. So it's not like halfway through they go, okay, we're getting rid of one person or two people. No, everybody stays. And we were staying in the barracks at the time. And um, one of my, uh, one of the guys that made the team with me, um, Rob Mitchell, he's, he's quite a, aviator he flew with his call sign scratch this guy's he's done a lot of really cool stuff he flew an f-86 i mean he comes from a family of pilots 
fighter pilots. Anyway, he's just a really good guy. He's scra Scratch and I were staying in the barracks together. We were in st stark competition with one another, big time. Not saying it, not being mean to one another, but I'm like, that is my adversary here, and I, because you, you're competing for a spot on the team. And so the tryouts, how they would go is you do a lot of wing work. You do the two and four planes, but you also did, um, they have to hire a solo pilot to an opposing solo. So you'd go out and you'd do uh, an aerobatic routine and, you know, uh, you f try to fly to altitudes and speeds and all be as accurate as possible. And, you know, and you didn't know what they were going to ask you to do. Um, and so you go through that whole process and at the end of it, um, if you're successful, you go to a certain slot on the team that has a vacancy, right? Typically, you'll have an outer, an inner, and a um, and a solo. Uh, and then you may or may, and a stem pilot, right? Four or five, the line of stern guys, um, or girls. And, uh, you know, and the lead may have changed too. So the lead change would happen every two years as well. But he's a former wing guy, so he kind of knows the pain you're going through. So he's the boss, and then, you know, the rest of you are the wingies. And so that's, and that, you know, in each time you come down, so you do the trip, you come down, and then they would go, okay, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What did you do wrong? What did you do right? Um, you know, what are you going to concentrate on tomorrow? Not too many people talked about strengths. Not too many people talked about where they did really did well. Uh, because I saw somebody say something that they thought they did well and somebody tore them to pieces. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it was for a bunch of different reasons. It was ruthless in that respect because I think they just wanted you to realize that you're not a standalone, you're part of a team. So you only are doing, your strength is that the team has a strength, not that you have a strength. Now, you may have something to offer, but God forbid you say that. You know, you just, the proof is in the pudding. So leave your ego at the door. That's the best way to do it. I think that's the beauty of military aviation is right. that's the spirit that's engendered. Yeah. Yeah. And each year we would change the show. So, you know, the lead would come in and go, I want to do this. Uh, these are the formations. And we had a book of formations that we would do. And we created a few formations, um, you know, in my time there as well. Uh, and. You know, you'd have that, and then the solos would be able to lead solo, and the opposing solo and the boss would create the integrated portion of the show to some extent. But a lot of that responsibility was, was given to the lead solo. So, um, you know, we just tried to tie those two things together, right? So the seven plane would be flying, and the two solos would integrate into that and do their, you know, their uh, crosses, we called them. Uh, so, was, you know, and our, our whole mandate really on the team was to try and have something in front of the crowd all the time. So we didn't, a lot of the faster teams, if, you know, like the Thunderbirds and not so much the Blues, but the Thunderbirds, you know, they go off stage and then they turn around, but they're doing like, you know, six, seven, eight miles a minute, it seems like, and they come around, so your turn circles are pretty big. So you're away from the crowd quite a bit. And you may have sometimes when the solos come in and eat up that time, but still it was, you know, there was big gaps there. And um, so we didn't want to do that. We wanted to be, you call it smoke on the stage, you know, no gaps more than 10 seconds or so. So boss would clear and I'd, solos coming on, smoke now. And we'd have something for the crowd. So one thing I know in the blues specifically, it's pretty legendary how they let their new, uh, the, the new folks, the new people that have been selected to join the team, there's a pretty specific way that they tell them. Is there any kind of tradition or lore to the Snowbirds, or what's, uh, what's oh, the process yeah. like? Well. How'd you find out, I guess I should say. At well, point? so, I mean, it's two weeks of really, really hard work, right? So when you come down to the last day, you really, I hate to say this, but you don't even care if you're, if you're successful or not, you're just happy it's over. So we retreated back to our barracks and we had plenty of Crown Royal and other stuff. And so we just indulged and we were told to be over to for the selection at four o'clock, I think, or actually it was 431, I think at the time, because 431, or it was 431 Air Demonstration Squadron. So it was 431, you had to be back there. I think that's how it all went down at least or maybe that was a crown roll but anyways it seemed like a good idea at the time but i think we were supposed to be there at four and we showed up at 4 31 and um and that was a big big no-no and so we got no we didn't know it at the time but 
you know, you come in individually to the boss's office, and um, he just says, okay, here's, here's how this went for you, and, and he tells you how you did. And the boss I had at the time, his name was Bob Payne Show Cowboy. That was his call sign. He was an unbelievably gifted pilot, good friend in the end. And um, anyhow, he, uh, so I get called in the room, and I had seen his wife at a bar downtown like three weeks before, not even during the tryouts, because nobody even went out in the weekends during the tryouts. This is like way before, you know, when I had time on my hands. And she was talking to me and, you know, whatever, and um, I just said hello, and that was it, right? And then on I went. And uh, and so anyways, now I'm getting debriefed by the boss, and he's got me in the room, and he's like, okay, Rooster, so, you know, you came up from E3s, this big airplane, this is a little airplane, but you had some time. And we thought, okay, he's got experience on the Tudor. He's, you know, he, all your stuff looked pretty good. But then we got in the airplane, and we were really wondering what was going on. And you just, we just moved you around, and we couldn't really find a real sweet spot for you. And, um, you know, but what really ticks me off um, is that you tried to pick up my wife in the bar, and I went. I didn't. I, I didn't even know what to say. Right. I mean, all, physically, I was shrinking on the chair. Right. I'm just like I'm slumping down and down and down. I didn't know what they were filming this thing. He had a little secret camera shooting at me. So, anyways, um, and then he he just changed his whole demeanor. He goes, "I'm kidding. You're on the team." And he threw a shirt at me. Right, a snowbird shirt. And I'm like, "What? What just happened?" Right. And so you don't even you're processing this thing and you don't even know what to do. And so you made the team, but you don't know what spot you got. So now you go and celebrate for about two or three hours. And, I mean, you celebrate. And, um, and you know, Canadians are kind of known for celebrating, so we celebrated a lot. And then you get together, and now they're going to tell you what spot you have because we forgot about that. I go, like, what am I flying now? Because then, you, you know, after a couple hours, you're like, okay, what spot have I got? And Scratch and I were... Well, I think Scratch wanted to be a solo. I, yeah, I, know, I knew for sure he wanted to, and I really wanted to be a solo. Like, really wanted to be a solo. So now that I made it, now I really want to be a solo. So anyways, you know, we get in the room together after having celebrated for quite a while, and then that's how they, they kind of put blindfolds on us, and they moved us around, and your counterpart would be the guy that would be in front of you when you took the blindfold off. Right, so lead solo, posing solo, outer, you know, would have his counterpart, the more experienced guy. And so anyway, so they did all this thing, and, you know, again, this whole thing is like, it's going back and thinking about it. I mean, I, you know, it was crazy. And they take my blindfold off, and somebody else is standing in front of me, and it was one of the, the line of stern guys. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to be a line of stern guy. And then all of a sudden they swapped us around, and I went, I was a solo guy, and I went, oh, happiness, right? And then, you know, big hug, and, and off you go. Lots of drama, good Lord. Huge. Yeah. And, then, and so now I, I, I just left Tinker to come do this. So you, boss is, this is a Friday, and he goes, okay, you need to be back at work on Tuesday, and you have to move. So I went back on an airliner to Tinker and packed up my place, which I didn't have a lot of stuff because I was a single guy, you know, but I had enough stuff that it was complicated. Movers came, everything gets done, and I was back at work, and next thing I know, I'm walking out and flying with the snowbirds. Wow, that's a heck of a transition, very, very quick. Yeah. What's the spin-up, the process to get you guys ready? Sure, I think, uh, again, I'm going to use some Air Force terms, some Navy terms, uh, COMAC cert, so I know the commander of Air Combat Command has to certify demo teams for the U.S. Air Force. Right. Who certifies the team for the Royal Canadian Air commander Force? Commander of the Air Force. Commander of the Air Force. So but literally, that doesn't happen for a while. I was so going to say, yeah, it's a so bit of a start process. Off, yeah, so you're going to start off in training now, and you're going to work through, and your air show season started at the time, somewhere around April, May. So you have about six months to get everything sorted out and practice that new show. And you and you fly twice a day um, in formation, and then the solos, we would fly an extra trip to try to get used to that. Because every solo, like the boss wanting to do his stuff, every lead solo would, I want to try this. And we had this book, and back in, you know, the Snowbirds have been around, we're doing our 50th anniversary celebration this year, actually been in existence for over 50 years, but because of COVID, we couldn't celebrate. So we just kind of, you know, didn't do it until we were able to do it proper. So, but, you know, 1970 was when it started. So this has been in existence for a long time. And over the years, 
um, all of what they, we have done, both on the formation side and on the solo side, has been documented in these like green books and um, there are green vinyl binders and uh, I remember when I got uh, when I became the lead solo that book was given to me and they go here's the book and I'm like the book is about you know maybe three quarters to an inch in thick and it's in it is like hand typed like on an old typewriter okay this is the you know this maneuver and and so or you're free to make up your own maneuver and and we did do that um, but typically, you know, to get back to your original question, you start out, it's a building block approach. And so you don't start off flying nine airplanes, obviously. You, your counterpart flies with you and he, he teaches you, um, you know, how to fly in that position. And so if you're an outer pilot, you're two airplanes out or three even, and they would do things like line abreast rolls. So you have five airplanes rolling and um, line abreast. And so that's a real whip, you know, and um, that's tricky. And, and But your counterpart doesn't know how to fly that on that side of the formation. He only knows his side of the formation or her side of the formation. So that that may be different in terms of, you know, the dynamics. Um, and so you teach you the spacing and, you know, how not to get sucked in so that you get closer than you really want to be. Uh, you know, we did fly four feet of overlap. Uh, for some of the formations I didn't myself or that was part of the seven plane that did that but um you know we flew close in the so we did things on the solos that you know it was it was challenging in its own right but um we were practice and, and one of the standard things we did was what we called up and downs with wraps and so we would dive down the boss would start the RT and he would say okay you know three back two back one back pulling up and then you get to the top, turning left, powering back, and then, you know, and then get to the bottom, and then he'd go tightening, right? So really have it like an up and a down, like a, almost like a little windy turn, it comes down, and then, so that whole iteration is basically the building blocks of everything that the, that the team did, everything. You know, we do a big diamond roll, nine airplanes, a lot of what that, you know, you're rolling the formation, you do a big diamond roll and loop. So rolling the formation when you're in the inside of the formation coming into you, okay, you're on the inside of the circle, I would have my speed brakes out to keep the airplane to power back, but not so far back that I would start, you know, if I was late on it, I'd get, um, I'd drag out because when you get to the top of it, now you're now on the outside and you need that extra bit of thrusties. So you have to time when you bring the boards in, uh, you know, speed brakes, and, um, and then you can maintain position and you kind of try to keep the formation flat too. I mean, there's a lot of things happening there that you learn. We had different terminology for it. We, if you get too close to an airplane, wingtip to wingtip, um, you get what we call tangling. And so, especially under G, you know, your wingtip vortices are coming off. They tend to push the airplanes away from one another. But if you get too far inside, they tend to bring you into each other for other reasons. So you really have to be wary of that. And it's you. You really want to be careful, especially flying formation like that. And you start to know you're getting good when your vision opens up, right? Like at first, you're looking at this little bit of the airplane, and all students that fly formation can, they, they know, they see, it's probably the NA in Navy or something like that. They're looking at that, and it's like they're looking through a toilet tissue tube. And then all of a sudden, you know, they start to widen that out and it gets to be where they're looking at the entire center mass of the airplane, but they're also seeing the extremities of it. And you're becoming more wary. And the secret to multi-airplane formation, especially when you're doing it dynamically like that, is that you fly through to the airplane that is like the boss. So I would fly through to and fly through to the boss and line up the canopies as best as I could. And you get you know, after two or three, after three years of doing that, you get really good at it. This is all you do. To the point where sometimes you're pulling up in a loop. I remember we were in Oceana and we were pulling up in a loop and it was super smooth. And I was like sitting in there going, this is, it, it appeared to be so easy at that time that I thought this shouldn't be easy like this, but why is this easy like this? You know, but you, you've been doing it for three years and you're just going, I, I mean, I can just, I'm thinking about, hey, I wonder what we're going to do tonight, you know, and, uh, you know, this is great. And then I got to smack myself again and go, okay, 
you know, get back to get back to business here. Exactly. Focus on what you're doing. Focus right on now. what you're doing. And you know, we did have things happen on that team, right? There's good things and bad things, and there's things that happened, and uh, happy to talk about that. Sure. Yeah. There's, <clears throat> you know, he, he, like Cowboy, the guy that hired me on the team, um, he was involved in a midair. He ended up going in the water, and um, that was on a media flight, and you know. You, when you're under the scrutiny that you're under on a demonstration team, it's immediate interest, right? And um, so you just don't, you, you know, you you really have to be careful how you're in these formations and you're thinking about things. And I still tell this to people, especially ones that are still, I'm still connected to people that fly in air shows. Um, you really don't want to let your mind wander all too much and nothing and usually when you're in the middle of a show that's not when something bad happens it's when you're off stage it's when you're doing a rejoin or when you know you're you've you've relaxed yourself down a little bit and now you're kind of settled in a little and you're like okay i can just relax now well don't relax that's the thing never relax when you relax that's when bad things happen and um you know you know, and we, we had our share of, of things like that. We had a, an incident. We used to land nine planes and take off nine planes. And when we landed nine planes, you had just done a show. So now you're all together and you're going to land now as a nine plane. So the show's not over yet. And so, um, you know, one of the guys got out of shape in the back of the formation. He managed to, um, uh, he went into the ground really hard and he damaged the airplane. Like, well, wrote it off basically, and he's skinning down the runway. So, we we had a contingency for when we landed with nine, where all the odd numbers would go to the left side of the runway, and all the right, the right side is the even numbers. So, they would always all go to the right side, <clears throat> and that way, you left a, a clear lane through the middle for high speed run out if somebody had a brake failure. Um, we didn't need it in this case because his airplane had no front wheel and one right main was through the wing but you know that just showed you when you get out of shape and you get into some dirty air it can really end badly so one of the unique things i think about the tutor is it's side by side seating you know look at the f-16 look at the f-18 the standard demo jets of the thunderbirds and the blues respectively uh do you always fly in the left seat is anyone ever in the right seat how does that work in that formation because someone's going to be flying cross cockpit at a minimum no 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 and that's exactly it right so if you're on the left side which i was number nine i flew from the right seat so the airplanes were modified. So I, my gear lever was moved from the left side over to here, so it sat by my knee, and then I had a big switch. So that airplane could have somebody fly from the left seat, but you had to move, and you know, and anybody that flies airplanes knows that, um, you know, I call them fat switches. The big switches that you have to lift and move, they're usually really important. And, uh, and so this one was really important, right? It decided which side that you were flying from, it activated. Um, you know, trims and things like that, um, which, uh, yeah, so that's how that all works. So all the guys on the left side formation, uh, they flew right seats, and if you're on the right side of the formation, you flew from the left seat, and if you were the boss and you used to fly and you're because you had to be a previous wingman, Cowboy, he flew from the right seat because he was an, a former number nine, so he flew from the right seat too very interesting and uh yeah i mean that's just you just get comfortable doing it that does limit your visibility in some ways but um but yeah not to the extent where it becomes well i won't say not a concern but it's just to the point where it's not it doesn't prohibit you from doing your function of course okay so you're certified you're you're ready to take the team on the road what's the show season like just kind of broadly speaking so the, we have two coordinators, uh, 10 and 11, and they, like we would train to be formation pilots, they would train to be coordinators. One's a experienced coordinator and one is a new one. Um, and so what they do is they go out and do all the pre-siting, they do all the, they have like kind of the really good job, you know, they go get wined and dined, they go to all these different functions, they go to all these, you know, I mean, they're flying all over the place. Their critical point, that, or their critical duty, I should say, is to go around and to organize all of the shows. And so they put the whole schedule together. And we didn't have a support aircraft, so we flew with everything in the airplane. And I think the length of the swings was basically predicated on how much you could put into the airplane. So how much clothes can you fit in there? How much... We had all our hydraulic fluid. We had some of it we would send to the show sites, but some of it we needed to carry on the airplanes because on the, you know, you're doing multiple hops 
to get to a certain show site, right? Sometimes you're flying four hops. You know, we do 300 miles on each one of these hops. And uh, so you're covering a lot of real estate. So you need to carry some some stuff with you. Uh, Toolkits, everything. They're all on the airplanes and our bags. We, you got to be really good at finding places to pack things on the airplane literally everywhere. Um, and so the swings would be nominally uh, maybe three to four weeks long. You'd stay on the road for four weeks. And so you start the show season in April, May, June, July, August, September, October, you'd end the season. So how many months is that? Like six plus maybe. So, uh, you know, you really, you're always gone. And um, But everybody has a secondary duty. Like I was, one year I was the claims guy. So everybody brought me their claims and I'm like, I am not a finance guy. So I had to... And everybody wanted their money, right? Because they take out these advances, you know, we're all... Anyways, you know how that works. And so I was busy. Like, I'd get home for three days, and I'd spend two of those days, like, putting white out on this piece of paper that I was trying to add up all these people's expenses. It was crazy. But each of us had a duty like that. And, um, you know, the uh, we had flight planners that would... every Two people that were dedicated. The inners were always the flight planners. And uh, the number nine, or the the lead uh, lead solo, was always the operations officer, and so that you had that duty to take care of when you were doing that. So it, this is kind of the way this thing all worked out, and it was lean, but it worked. And we didn't have cell phones. I think my last year on the team was we started to get cell phones. I don't even know how we did things without a cell phone, but we managed to. In some ways, it's a bit easier, right? Because nobody can get in touch with you. So. So anyways, yeah, that's kind of how that all worked itself out. Right? Makes sense. What about your maintainers? Did you bring them? Were they yep. in the other seat on the road with you? Yeah, so my maintainer, so I was Snowbird 9, and I had 9 Alpha with me. And he was the crew chief, the crew, or the sorry, the deputy crew chief, and the crew chief flew with the boss. Ah, okay, for the for the entire team? For the entire team. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. And then wow. the rest, and you had an avionics technician, you had a, you know, um, yeah, power over. plants, airframes, exactly. a little bit of everything. Exactly. And okay. everybody was kind of multi-skilled. Right? You mentioned 1970s when the team stood up with the tutor. What year were you? Uh, or years were you on the team? I, w- I joined the team in 2000. 2000. Okay. 30 years on those airplanes, right? And like you mentioned, you're flying them hard. You're not. This is not a Sunday, you know, trip no. to the fair. Could the airplanes? Could you see age on them even then? Oh yeah. yeah okay. Big time. I mean, especially on the. Um, Especially on the solo jets, like we would, you know, when you fly through somebody's wash, uh, especially at speed and under G, it's really like you get a real shudder out of the airplane. Well, do it once, do it twice, hey, no big deal. The airplanes are kind of built to do that. Do that over and over and over again, or subject the airplane to a lot of rolling G just because you're not uh, doing it cleanly. We tried to roll as fast as we could and as efficiently as we could, but sometimes you do a slight loading on the airplane. Um, and so because of that, those airplanes, you know, you're just elevating the, 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 uh, the wear and tear on them over and over again. And, you know, that's the challenge of keeping a, the same airplane for all those years because you start to run out, obsolescence comes in, right? Um, you, you can't find the simplest of little parts. There's a bushing and they don't make that bushing anymore. Okay, guess what? We have to start making that bushing. And so that's what we would do. And you get fairly and really good at what you do. And that's the ingenuity of it, right? I mean, when you watch maintainers with those airplanes, and I think the blues were a lot like that too, to be honest, because they could get in those airplanes and they just, they learn how to fix them and and get them where they need to be. So, I mean, they're kind of the unsung heroes, right? And you wouldn't be flying if they weren't there doing what they do. So it, it was really, it is a, it is a huge team effort end to end. Was it something that you enjoyed working? Uh, Cause I, you also talked about, you know, yes, you're, you're working with that maintenance team, but you're not at home. You're always on the road. You're always somewhere new. Was that always a fun challenge or could sometimes you, you got to put nine airplanes up in the air on a, on, on the clock at a certain point. Is it a challenge or is it sometimes kind of a frustration too? No, it's a challenge for sure. I mean, and every site is different, but you get really good at what you do when you get used to your, this is how we do things. There's a process for it. There's a checklist for doing it. Everybody does what they they need to do. The coordinators are there. They, they get there before we get there. They, they mark out the spots where we park. Um, you know, they're talking to the organizers. They're, they're basically going through and, and just making everything unwrinkled. So when we get there, we don't need to worry about anything because as soon as we get there, usually there's a function. 
So you're getting out of the airplanes, you're grabbing your bag, you're getting all your things together, jumping in your rental car, going somewhere where you've never been before hotel-wise, and hopefully you don't get lost. And that, and this is the thing, the coordinators will provide these highly detailed maps of how to get to places, and they go, don't do this, do this. And tonight, this is who we're meeting, boss, this is what you're doing. Guys, you know, four, five, and six, you guys are gonna go and do this tomorrow, and then you're gonna do this, seven, eight, and nine. So everything is very choreographed, and everything is built so that you get as much bang for your buck as you can. We never charge for anything for our shows either. Like, I mean, some teams go out there and they charge a minimum amount of money, and I understand that, but we never charged anything. Our job, the only mandate we had is if, and we would try to go, we would try North American team, but um, we would try to do, if we had a show site in Canada and there was a show site request in the U.S., there would have to be a very compelling reason why we wouldn't perform for the people in Canada. So, you know, and we did things all over the north and all over. I mean, I've been everywhere and, uh, you know, in, with the team, both in the U.S. and in Canada. I think one of the most exciting things about air shows is you bring people that might otherwise have that you talked about as a child, right? You have that deep visceral connection to aviation. A lot of people, they see it on TV, they see it in a movie, maybe that documentary you've seen recently, Top Gun Maverick. It's a joke. It's not a, it's, yeah. it's not a documentary. It's a, it's a work of fiction. But the reason I mention that is that's their only connection to aviation. And then they get to see someone like you at an air show. Some of the yeah. greatest moments I've had is not even necessarily wearing this uniform. I remember as a college student standing with a Cessna, and we were the only, uh, our airplane was the only one that we allowed people to sit in. And we had just a stream of kids because they all wanted to sit in the seat and yank on the flight controls and right. all that stuff some of the questions some of the like their responses were just the greatest things ever in my mind as a demo pilot you're you're showing these airplanes to the whole country and in some cases other countries too any good distinct memories of like i don't know just getting to show off the airplanes and really feeling that connection with the crowd uh yeah there's certain show sites that um you know like in canada abbotsford is a very famous one c and e toronto is a very famous one all show sites just had a little bit of something it's really hard to single one out um there's sometimes always some there's there's and you really have to be careful with it and this is the one thing that you kind of learn later on is that you, you know you're not you don't own that suit right that red flight suit even though you get to keep it when you leave you're renting it and so you're representing something bigger than you ever were and the sacrifices that the guys made um, you know, when the team first started, because they weren't sanctioned, and really, it, Colonel O.B. Philp was a guy, and he's quite a character. I never met him. I know his family, um, but uh, he was quite a character in terms of he knew how to piece things together, and he knew how to get things through the approval process, or he knew, he knew, if he didn't have approval, he knew how to go ahead with it until he was getting approval, if you know what I mean. I do. <laughs> so, and at that time, you could do that. That was a different time in the Air Force. I think you'd struggle to do that same sort of thing now, because it's just too much scrutiny, and there's, you know, we have social media, and you have all these different... Th you didn't have that back then. It, it was basically a rumor until you verified that that's, in fact, what they were doing. So anyways, you know, you keep that in mind that these guys, they, they really did spearhead the whole thing before you and you're just there to kind of keep it going and you don't want to be the guy that screws it up um, or, or put a wrinkle in it, I guess. And so, you know, there's a lot of responsibility with respect to that. And I think if you realize that or when you realize that, it changes everything for you. And so when you go to these shows and you see these kids and a lot of even anybody, right, there's a lot of pride that goes with that. And, um, you know, I mean, I was flying, we were flying on 9-11 was a bad day for us, right? We were in Halifax and obviously we had launched some airplanes and then the towers were hit and we were in, we had, the team was completely separated. We, we didn't know that what had happened had happened. Oh, we were in Halifax on the East Coast and you could physically see the cons of the airliners turning around and going back or recovering in Gander and Stephenville and some were recovering in Halifax. You know, that's where a lot of the airliners ended up and all of a sudden all these people were wandering around the city of Halifax. And so it was a really crazy, just surreal time. Um, so for us, we had six airplanes that were, that were flying. They had gotten off the ground. We were the last three ship, right? The Vic, last Vic to go, but we got stopped. They said, sorry, they've shut the airspace down. So six were in the air, we were on the ground, and um, so we went and parked, and now we're there, and we don't know what to do, and so we're, you know, fortunately had cell phones, and so we could communicate and talk, hey, what's going on? And um, 
we had permission from the uh, Minister of National Defence in Canada to fly two two days after they gave us permission just for the team to reunite in Quebec City. So we did that, right? And it was a really eerie time to fly. There was nobody talking on the radio. Um, you know, obviously I'd come off the E3 tour and I kind of was in the in the back of my mind at night. I was thinking, I want to go back to my squadron and I want to do what we're going to do, right? And so, um, anyways, so we got back together and um, <clears throat> went back to Moose Jaw, did some maintenance because we weren't sure what was going to happen with the show season. A lot of the air shows stopped doing air shows because it just wasn't possible and they, you know, air shows are they're financially challenging to run to begin with and so you throw something like that into it and you know you you make it almost impossible to do and go through so um we did however want to do one show uh it was on tucumcari new mexico and um one of the things on the snowbirds and um i'll just kind of go off that a little bit but we had a when you made a mistake on the team like if you made a smoke error or something like that that was five dollars so it's called the Fiverr Fund. And so you go through these swings, and we had a maximum amount of money. It was 250 or $300 per swing. So we wouldn't go over that. So if you're a real massive screw-up and you're hitting $300, you know, that's, you've messed up a lot, right? you got like 60 mess-ups. So that's a lot. So you're highlighting yourself. So anyways, we thought we'd better cap it because we don't want to break anybody's spirit. But all that money would go into a kitty, and at the end of the year, we had what we called the smoke oil party. The smoke oil is what you burn for the smoke. So we called it the smoke oil party. And um, I was selected to plan the smoke oil party, and we were in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Um, so we were going to have our smoke oil party there. And so they were really happy to have us because everybody was really down after that whole thing. You know, it was just, I mean, I don't know where you were, you know, old you were at the time. I was a little kid, but I distinctly remember the world changing. Yeah. yeah. So everything was in this flux and everybody kind of was just clamoring to make it as normal as possible. And so we thought maybe we could get it there, you know, and you know, that was one of the things we did. And <clears throat> so anyways, and we had our smoke oil party and I just remember this lady was running this. We were staying in this, uh, like a motel on route 66 in Tucumcari and she was she had like this beehive hairdo thing from like the 1950s i mean i just and she goes and i had all the money because i was planning the smoke oil party and so i had a lot of money and um and she said okay so how much what do you want uh, what booze am i ordering what food are you wanting and all this and i go okay for food we'll just do like can we do mexican have like a mexican type thing everybody kind of like that yeah 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 of course you can and then and then I, the liquor order came in, and she goes, oh, my goodness. Like, I, I literally was ordering enough liquor to, like, immobilize an army. And she goes, oh, my God. I mean, that is half of what we ordered for the uh, football team's Rattler reunion. I just remember saying that. So we were going to have a good time. But back to the, you know, sorry, jumping back to the, to the, to the air show itself. And Tucum Carey, we did it every year. It was, um, it was always a fun air show. Um, or have you ever been to Tucum Carey? I've not, it's in no. the middle of nowhere right but canon air force base is kind of clovis i know the airspace yeah yeah, yeah. so there's exactly not a lot <laughs> there's nothing there right yeah and uh so you know and i just remember somebody came up to me and one of the memories i had was this person a lady an older lady actually came up and she just was very thankful that we came down and made the effort to come down and just kind of brighten her day after all that travesty that went down in new york so um and we were more than happy to do that and I thought that was, uh, you know, that was that that stands out always when I think about it. For sure, it's the uh, you like you said you're that that red flag that you're the representative of your country, but you can also do you know good or bad things in that yeah. in that stead, you know, to either advance or, I hate to say, bring it the other way, but. Um, yeah, I think of any of anyone that had the appreciation. You you'd flown in the U.S. Air Force, right, on a incredibly important airplane. You knew what that event meant for our country and for right. your country, and frankly, the world in general. Yeah. My only distinct memory, well, I say only, I have a couple distinct memories of 9/11, but I remember what you mentioned earlier, how quiet it was. Yeah. You don't realize how much just airplane noise you hear in the sky that you kind of maybe drown out in the back of your mind, yeah. and it all went away for about a week. Yeah. And it was a very strange feeling. Flying during that time was really eerie, especially on two days afterwards, because there was nobody flying. And, you know, so um, it's just it's just you don't realize all of the, the you know, the external things that happen and, and how much they mean and, and how much you recognize when they're not there. 
we talk about the greats, obviously the Snowbirds. I'm going to say the Blues around there, the Thunderbirds, the Royal uh, Royal Air Force Red Arrows. Did you ever ch- have a chance to interact with or fly with any of those other demo teams? Yeah, I flew with the. I was supposed to made some fairly decent friends. We had a reunion down in Pensacola, the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels and the Snowbirds. We all got together, and that was when um, JTs. Uh, what was that? Uh, TJs. Uh, is it Trader John's, I think? Trader John's. Yeah, T- yeah. sorry. No, you're good. You're good. So yeah, Trader John's was open. Uh, they had reopened it, and they had the Blue Angel Room, so we went in there and had a big uh, get-together. And um, uh, I had, I was supposed to fly with the um, Thunderbirds and the Blues. I'd, made, I'd taken both of the solo pilots flying. Um, Scott Cartvet, who's now a United guy, and I think he's like the honorary. He's a big ambassador for the Blue Angels right now. Super nice guy. They called him intake. He had this massive nose. And uh, so there's a call sign for you. It's a good so, call sign. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I hope he's not. He doesn't listen to this. He'll be <laughs> mad at me. So, uh, so anyways, we all got together, and, but there was a tropical depression. And so, you know, we, not knowing the area, and it was all moist, and, our, you know, we elected. We weren't going to fly the next day. Thunderbirds made the same decision. Blue Angels were like, now we're flying. And uh, and and I was going for a ride that day with uh, intake in the solo jet. And so I was like, are you sure you're not going to cancel? You know, and I hate to give up the opportunity. I'm certainly glad I didn't in hindsight. But anyway, so we went out flying and there's a low deck, much like it was today, actually. And, you know, they do that signal. They do the, the roll on takeoff. And I mean... Um, I mean, when you're in the back of the airplane and somebody's flying, it's different, right? You're you're not really doing anything. You're just kind of hoping that they don't mess up. And um, so we're doing all that stuff. But, you know, if I rewind to the briefing, you know, every team has a different way of briefing the show. And um, the Snowbirds, we had a way of going through it. And um, one of the things when we did uh, what we called splits, so when we broke the formation up, so we'd have nine airplanes. We do a Canada split, right? Or you know, we'd had all downward bomb bursts and stuff like this. We go snowbird split now, and then certain guys would go in the S and split, and then now P and pause. That and we would say that out loud, and everybody thought that was kind of humorous, and they were like kind of laughing at us. And I, so I'm listening to the blues briefing, and he's like, you know, he's kind of singing it, right? The lead singing it, and of course I'm not cracking the smile, but inside I'm kind of going, okay, well you can't really say anything about us because that's what you guys are doing but anyways so then at the conclusion of the briefing they go around the table and they say okay what's everybody going to work on today you know what's your aims and the corrections you're going to make what are you trying to get out of today's flight because every flight you need to have a purpose right not only just have a good show but also but also to work on any maybe what you did the previous show so they go around the table and of course and and, uh, intake is last because he's six I think he was and uh Anyways, he's like, I'm going to work on my timings for the cross. I'm going to work on my set for, uh, I think, one of their passes. And he said, I'm going to crush Rooster. And uh, and I remember I, I was just thinking, okay, this is not going to end well for me, right? And because when he says that, he's going to do that to me. And so I thought this, you know, I'm outside doing knee bends and jumping jacks and everything, trying to get myself ready to go, you know, consuming copious amounts of H2O, just trying to get as far ahead of that as I can. And um, and he was almost successful, but I stayed awake with no G suit on for the um, you know max max rate turn that they do. It I is impressive a, to watch. A horrendous amount. And when he did the look, the sneak pass, um, I mean, I have a, a VHS tape from the airplane that I haven't had converted yet. I will have to do that. Yeah, for point. sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you could not see the vertical tail because of the cotton ball around the airplane and we were just going down the runway and Scratch, my friend Scratch, right? He was watching and he goes, I, and he was a Hornet demo guy himself. He'd done a a lot of really cool flying. And so uh, anyways, he saw the jet going across the runway and he said, you know, half the cotton ball was kind of resting on the runway. You know, that's the proximity. I mean, we were literally on the runway and uh, I just remember looking down and seeing, you know, 1.01, 0.99, 0.98, 1.00, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, and the, and the front of the airplane is is bouncing a little bit. So it's a testament to the how great the fly-by-wire is on the Hornet for sure. 
because uh, that's a challenging place to get an airplane to fly. Yeah, that was uh, that was quite a memory. I bet it was, man. What a cool uh, what a cool way to do it. And thankfully, you had the weather to get the, the demo out. You're you're absolutely right. Even I think uh, today they rehearsed. Uh, there's storms all around, but they had that little bubble that they needed, and they yeah, got it done. That little area. Oh, yeah. and they they yeah they'll go out and make it work. Yeah. The other team I flew with was the Red Arrows, and that was kind of flying. I mean, that was did interesting for a bunch of other different reasons. But they are. Where'd you get to fly with them? Uh, we did, we did fly with them. I flew with them in Toronto. Toronto. Okay. So they yeah. came over across to, to I flew show. them. They came and flew with us. And then I flew with, uh, their synchro. They call them, they're not solos or synchros. Synchros. Okay. What's it like having someone in the airplane with you in the demo? Because I'm, you're used to being, like you mentioned, by yourself in one seat or the other based on where you are in the formation. How does it work with a passenger? Is it just kind of like sit down, shut up, don't touch anything with yellow and black stripes? Pretty much. Okay. Um, I, mean, I hate to say it, but yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> no, it's, but, it's fair. You know, yeah. Normally, in the in the demo, we wouldn't fly with anybody for all the different risk reasons and things like that, you know. And just you know, there is still an elevated level of risk for obvious reasons. So you just want to. But we could take passengers during practices, and the practices were no different than the show for the most part. So, you know, when we would roll the airplane, you know, I would tell them, "Look, I'm going to roll the airplane, and the stick is going to come into your leg. And if your leg's in the way, I'm going to." push the stick through your leg and so it's you're going to get bruised and also the g uh, the g was i mean i didn't realize it at the time but i mean it was punishing right like we would we would do um you know we would do things like you know 6g or something like that out of the bottom of the loop and then we'd roll upside down and push minus three so now you have a 9g gap that you're dealing with plus all the physical elements of that you know blood and all that sort of thing in your consciousness and the risk of graying out and, and g locking but you just get so used to it, you know, and I, I just can't imagine somebody riding that out next to me and thinking, this is fun, right? I mean, you're just, you're in a washing machine and uh, that's all you're, you know, so it's really hard. Is it negative into positive that'll usually make people G-lock or is it the other way around? I know neither one is good, but. I, I think it's when you come from negative and then you switch over and you go to positive um, because you're just not ready for that. And now you can get the transition. We did studies on it. I had some friends at work studies on it, trying to do a push-pull effect in that and see what it does to people. Um, obviously, if you're a little shorter like I am, you're in a better spot than if you're taller like you are. And, you know, now you're dealing with that little bit of a, okay, I need to squeeze a little harder, but the G-suit really does help out, but we didn't have one, you know, at the time. So um, it, you'd come down from those shows, and I mean, I, I I know for a fact I wouldn't even be able to come close to that physically right now and do it. It was just punishing, especially if it's warm out and that, you know, so um, there's a, all sorts of all sorts of challenges that went into it. You mentioned earlier your dad and photography, and one of the things I love to do is photography air-to-air, -air especially. That's the, the king, the very best for me. And one of the things I like to tell folks when I fly, I've flown with some great formation pilots, but flying form for photos is a little different. What matters is what's in the photo, not how good you think you look compared to the other airplane. Right. The same thing I'm told with the demo team, right? You, it's formation flying, but what you care about is how the crowd sees you. So, for example, that's when right. you see the two jets cross, well, they're maybe not as close as they actually look. It's an optical illusion that you, as a member of the crowd, is seeing. Yeah. As a solo, what a, maybe just kind of take us into that. What's some things that maybe that the audience wouldn't necessarily realize is happening in front of them, but it looks just as sharp as a tack? Yeah, well, you, well, you do actually. You know, like, the more you get comfortable with it, the way we did it, um, because we didn't, some teams use the heads-up display. So they'll put the flight path vector and put the other, they'll, relative to the other aircraft, they'll just kind of mark it out a little bit and they'll say, yeah, that's about good enough. Um, we didn't have that. Um, so when we started doing crosses, um, all I would do is take them up quite simply and we'd go down a road. And I would say, you fly on that side of the road and I'll fly on this side of the road. And we're at a thousand feet. We're not close to the road. So there's more gap than you probably care to admit. But still, it gives you the impression of seeing the airplane show up, you see the light, you see the closure, you see what's happening, and you see, okay, what do I need to do um, in order to make the miss? And so the two responsibilities that the solo had was um, quite simply making the miss and what we called setting the step. And what you're referring to is a step. So if the show line's 1,500 feet away and we're flying at 300 feet, right, above the ground, and that's what we did, remove the zeros out of that and you have 15 divided by three so one foot is equal to five feet so every five feet of lateral you set a step of a foot okay so 
you start to recognize through this exercise that we did coming at one another, if I'm 20 feet apart, I got four feet a step. And four feet doesn't sound like a lot, but it is, right? It's four feet and, you know, it's a yard up. And I mean, as you, as you get closer and closer. So now we would typically miss by about 35 to 50 feet, somewhere around there at the end of the season. So, you know, you're, and you're doing 300 knots coming at one another for most of the crosses. So you have 600 knots of closure. So things are happening very quickly. And the lead solo's job is to run the line and to set the timing for the center cross. And so, you know, if you're one second left or one second right, you'd add, you know, appropriate second to your pull on this side. So if you're, I don't want to get too complex because obviously, you know, it's hard to talk about just to visualize it. But if I'm right of cent of the show center, then I'm going to want to pull this airplane that's, that missed that much to the right first before I pull the guy on the left. So I can correct it back to center. And so you're doing that mental math in your head. So you're not only when you cross, are you looking at how good the cross is, but also where you were relative to the show center. And it sounds like there's a lot of stuff happening, and there is, but you get used to it. And um, and then you start to get really close. And, um, you know, what I used to say when I was, a, you never want to be closer than you thought you were. That's the thing. So if you can be as close as you want, just as long as you meant to be that close, because I'm okay. I'm not going to judge you on it. I'm concentrating on something else. So your job is to make the miss and get the step correct. And that's all you need to do. The closer you are, the lo you have very little step because you're laterally, you're not that far apart. Um, you know, but we would do things like the co-loop, which is now a vertical. And that was kind of the PhD of crosses. You know, that's what you really trained to do. And now you're coming in the vertical and you're missing at the top. And the unfortunate bit is we had two guys hit doing that and then that maneuver went away. They thought the safest thing. And actually I didn't disagree with it at the time because one of the things that we didn't really chat about is that the Snowbirds became the only team that was flying the, the Tudor after about 2004 or five. I can't remember exactly when we did that. But the rest of the, so folks were coming to the airplane from different platforms. So they come from a T6. Now they're on the Tudor. Well, it may seem like a simple transition, but maybe it isn't. And so the more experience, like I had like almost 2,000 hours on the airplane when I was flying the show just in my previous instructor time. So I'm coming in with this whole bucket of experience. I know this airplane like I could, I'm, I'm convinced I could jump in the airplane today and I'd probably stumble a little bit, but it would be like putting on an old pair of 501s, right? I go, yeah, I love this thing, man. This is, you know, you're at home. There's certain airplanes that you fly over your career where you can just jump in them any day of the week and go, yeah, I... I get it. And so, um, you know, that was difficult for those people to transition to that airplane. So now you get them doing these complex maneuvers um, where time is of the essence and you you like to give yourself some time to make big decisions, but sometimes you don't have a lot of time. You know, you come to the top of a co-loop, you have very little acquisition time. The airplanes are almost ballistic because you're, you're pushing to round out the loop. And so really you only have lateral control of the airplane with the rudder. So those ones, you know, you go to an air show and watch uh, some of these acts that are doing something like that and they're close, you can correct everything with the step too. Like I can be 300 feet away from you, but as long as I stagger myself away, we look like we hit, right? And you don't want to use that term, but that's kind of what you want to call it, the hit, that you're crossing and it looks like you're flying through one another. Um, unfortunately, if you don't do it right and you don't, and, and if one person, if both people try to make the miss or one person tries to help out the other person, it's going to end badly, and that's what ended up happening. We lost somebody, and we nearly lost two people, but we fortunately, uh, you know, not fortunately, I mean, it was a tragedy all the way around, but, uh, you know, one managed to survive, one didn't. You mentioned that really, really terrible day. How, as a team and as an individual, how do you come back from that? Because like you said, you all know one another so very well. You're working together all the time so very closely. <clears throat> it's got to be just the worst day of everyone's life, but then you also, you go on. You continue to represent Canada and the Air Force. But it's not, I cannot imagine it's an easy thing to do. No, and a lot of people have, um, you know, you you know, you're with a group of professionals. You're, you're really, you're, you're on a, you know, a very, you're with a talented group of people. Things happen. 
and then you know and things happen for sometimes inexplicable reasons you don't know exactly there's an investigation that's ongoing but maybe they know it's not the airplane's fault it's not somebody just made a mistake and unfortunately it's a very unforgiving game um and what you and if everybody ended up coming back we had some mid-airs we had people touch i mean um it happens right if you fly close together like that it happens and you better admit that because if you don't admit that you're gonna it, you're bound to fail but when you come down you know we had one, oh man you know i really i i just apologize i'm just gonna I'm, I'm gonna be done with it and we're like no that's not this this is not what this is i mean this is we can learn from this we'll come away from this um if you do something negligent that's different but nobody does anything negligent i mean you know it would it, that just doesn't happen so really what it is is just a momentary kind of you know mistake we'll call it we always said well you can't make mistakes you can make a few little errors but no big mistakes and it's kind of true right um but at the end of it coming back is the most important thing um you know if you get into a car accident with your car and everybody walks away you know, you've crushed your ego you have insurance your car gets fixed you get back in it you drive your car if you fall off your horse you get back on the horse if you if you you know you're on your motorcycle and you do a jump and you fall off the bike you get back on the bike you do it again you know you just do that i mean that's part of life right um and that's no different on the snowbirds the snowbirds is the same thing one you have a very special trained group of people we just can't plug and play people the good news is nobody died right and if you did lose a team member um you know you that that's a hard thing to overcome but you have to do it and um there's different ways of dealing with that everybody's different everybody handles that sort of thing differently um I'll tell you an experience I had. I was a lead solo at the time, and um, we had just gotten new seatbelts in the airplane um, over the Christmas period. So the way the season would work out, you'd, you'd really work hard training up until Christmas time, and then uh, we'd take a two-week break for Christmas and come back where well, we'd take the opportunity to put some new seatbelts in the airplane um, that we got. They are kind of the same as what was being flown in the T-38 at the time. And um, the only difference being that we integrated our parachute into the seat belt so we had an arming key that you had to put in the middle of this thing and you know um there's some engineering required to do that and they had to attach this thing and so that was all fine we came back they gave us an ejection few ejection trainers i mean it's a seat belt right a seat belt shouldn't be difficult to use and so anyways we get in the airplane we're hooking up the seat belt and the ejection trainer everybody gets a thumbs up now we're going to go flying and so the first trip of the day back from christmas uh, was um, just a formation flight with the, the whole team together, nine airplanes. And I got in the airplane and I was struggling to put my seatbelt. I couldn't get it to latch together. Um, and the way we would, you know, when we put the seatbelts on, it wasn't a simple latch, latch, click, click, five-point harness thing. It was like put the seatbelt on and then really tighten up the hip straps. Like, you can't move. I am in my shoulder straps. I don't want to move in the airplane. Um, you know, I really want to be fixed into it. I was really struggling to get this lap belt to kind of come together. And um, and so I called the safety system guy over. You know, we had an expert on that. He came in. He, he's new to this, too, obviously, because it's a new system. And so, um, and I was the opso at the time. So I was really interested because now I've got the whole, like, the line of airplanes. I'm kind of that focal for that to some extent, or at least I think I am. And... Um, and so anyways, we got this chap over, and he looks at it, and he's like, yeah, just put it together, he says. And then we we obviously didn't understand the entire system as good as we should have. But we put it together, it clicked. And so I think most people say when a seatbelt clicks, it's it's in. It's it's done. So we went flying, and no big deal, and uh, had a good trip, came down. You know, the second trip of the day now is going to be um, half formation with the nine plane and half solo. And what I would do in that case, now I've got the solo, so we'll start off, we'll raise our altitude up by about 100 feet uh, for crosses. So we go from three to 400 feet. And, um, you know, and just do an easy cross to begin with, get our eyes kind of, you know, get that sight picture again and refresh ourselves. And then we'll start maneuvering, doing, uh, we do a, a cross that would, you know, we do a roll and then we do another one to invert it. So we hit and roll upside down and then carry it out. And then my function as a lead solo would be, you know, I'd, I'd call for the rolls. I'd say roll now, and then roll out now, smoke off now, downwind, go. And then we cross downwind, talk about it, how did it go? That was good. Okay, let's do this now. 
and we just did what we called audibles and uh, but kind of you know you're just getting into it again so now we're doing the second trip we do the nine plane with the seven aircraft and then the boss splits the solos off so we go we had an airfield a little auxiliary airfield that was an old world war ii training airfield kind of like whiting field i think is kind of here and uh, it was a runway that served our show line and so that's where we do our crosses and so anyways we set up there came in got anything uh, to say nope okay 400 feet we'll start we'll do one just level cross we did that second one was an aileron roll and on that trip when i got in the airplane i had the same issue with the seat belt and you know it, it, this time it clicked a little sooner i still got the guy out to look at it the safety systems uh, uh crewman and he's like yeah it looks fine and so anyways and i tightened it up really tight you know because now we're doing solo stuff so i really put some tension onto the belt so if it was going to come apart it was coming apart there anyways um so now we go up on the trip, we do the first level cross, we do one to an aileron roll, and then we roll up the third one. Now we reset and come down. This is going to be a roll to invert it. So, and I'd typically carry it out for, we'd roll to invert it and then carry upside down, run the entire length of the show line for about like 10 seconds or so. And then I'd call for the rollout now and then smoke off now. And so anyways, we came in, did the, um, my posing is uh, Wayne Mott was his name and his call sign was Smut. And, uh, Anyways, so I go, okay, Smut, how's everybody feeling? Okay, it's feeling great. Okay, let's go in and do this. And uh, so we came running at one another, um, rolled upside down, and all of a sudden it was like the world exploded. And I, I mean, I literally fell out of the seat, and I, I didn't know what happened. I thought maybe the tail had come off. I didn't know. I mean, I, I didn't know what happened. And uh, I hit the canopy really hard, and um, I was upside down looking down at the stick. And um, I went, okay, the airplane's still flying. And I uh, hit the stick and, you know, rolled right side up. But when it rolled right side up, we, had, we were carrying our um, seat pack underneath our butt. You know, had all our survival stuff like this, uh, this sleeping bag that they managed to scrunch into something the size of an iPhone, right? And anyways, and all this jazz was in there. So anyways, I've got this big box attached to my butt. Well, when I came down into the seat, I didn't come into the seat completely. I was kind of sitting on the on the front of it. And the airplane started to go down. It started to point towards the ground. It was losing, like it was just, you know, maybe at about three, 400 feet a minute rate of descent, but just accelerating. And I, I couldn't get it to recover. I couldn't get the stick back far enough because the box was in the way. And um, so, I didn't I didn't know anything else and it was one of these moments when I just went I started running the trim back and it pulled out and uh, I got away from the ground and uh, smut didn't know what happened because I stopped talking right aviate navigate communicate communication was way down range in terms of stuff to say here and so I recovered he, and he just got on the radio real guarded like I, I still remember how he said it he said are you still there and I went yes I'm okay, my, my seatbelt broke. And he goes, what? And I said, my seatbelt came apart. And so I, my neck was really sore because I hit the canopy and uh, really hard. And the, my knee hit the bottom of the instrument panel and I, was, I uh, cut it a little bit. Um, but he came on the wing and um, we went back and landed, told him, I didn't know what to tell Tower. I just knew that I didn't want to do anything different. I didn't try to hook up the seatbelt again. I just I, I managed to squirm worm my way back in. So now I'm sitting at least in the in the bucket of the seat once I got away from the ground. And we came back and landed, um, just single ship and stream. I didn't want him on my wing because I didn't know. Mm. And um, you know we found out that there was a issue. And it's it's weird how these things kind of work their way into the thing. The only thing that was wrong was when they attached the arming key. They used a rivet, and depending on how much force they put on the head of the rivet it would like create a certain amount of clearance and so um obviously in my case i didn't have as much clearance as maybe say for example scratch uh, he probably had clearance on his but i didn't so that's what happened to me so there's a bunch of learning in there that you go you, know, you think you did everything you could do and i i just remember coming home that night and um, anytime you have a close call in an airplane or in life in general my what i experience is incredibly hot feet 
So when I was laying in bed, I was like, all of a sudden I went, holy crap, that was almost it. That was almost curtains. And, um, you know, that, that would have been it. And nobody would have known. I mean, they would have figured it out eventually because um, I don't know how much crash investigation you've done. I've done, a, I've done a few, unfortunate. I've participated in a few investigations and attended a few of the schools. But, um, the, uh, you know, the, an airplane, you know, it, the seat belts will tend to follow if they, you know, that seat trail would be, and we know that because they actually had a crash after that or with a, somebody came out of the seat, one of the team pilots, and he was killed in Ellsworth Air Force Base. So it's a bit of a sad story there and a sad ending. And, it, you know, it was one of these things that if you line up all of what had happened after my incident and then a few years later, they go through the investigation, they come up with determinations, they come up with a fix, and then the bureaucracy of the military takes hold, and then eventually you get these things that happen, you know. It's a bit of a sensitive subject. It still is for, for some folks. It certainly is for me. Um, I do remember getting the call, and they said, how will you know that there was an issue with the seatbelt? And I said, um, because the smoke will have a kink, I would suspect. If you have it on film, you'll see that. Because when you lose control of the airplane, it's just a very it's really hard and um, you know the tail of the airplane will come butt down and you'll get a big kink in the smoke and you'll see that they're out of control or not in control my what happened to me because I was a single plane I wasn't flying formation he was in formation so his primary thing was to get away from the formation so he even went harder away and, um, and that changed the whole dynamic of what he experienced in the airplane uh, but, it, you know, a seatbelt coming loose is just, I mean, it, it, it should never happen. But it did. And, um, you know, for me, that was, you know, it was, it was one of those things and, uh, you know, always stands out. And, uh, you know, and then the next day we went back flying again. You know, I mean, f we figured it out. I mean, it was the next day, I think. We just said, yeah, we th here's what we're going to do. And here's, we found the problem, like, instantly. And so we let the investigation process go through its paces, and then at that time, that's what we did. To someone that's never been through something that traumatic, and then you just made that comment, and then we went flying the next day. Yeah. The meant the headspace to do that is not. It sounds. I don't know if it even sounds easy. It doesn't sound easy, but yeah. that's what a professional aviator. That's what. That's where the line is right there, and that's what yeah. you are on that team. You are literally. You're representing Canada. Right? You're representing the Air Force. You are the best of the best. And then the fact that you can get back on the horse and keep doing that is, I think it's incredible. I think it's something to be. <clears throat> yeah, I just remember the one thing I did do, and my crewman was there, and, you know, and, uh, you know, you kind of deal with, everybody deals with stuff like that in their own way. But for me, um, the helmets we were wearing, we had these little rubber tabs on top, and it was kind of like where your visor, I think it was meant to stop your visor from going all the way back or something. But that rubber tab put a real distinct mark on top of the canopy. And... Um, so they said, hey, I'm going to wash that off. And I go, no, you're not. And um, that's staying there forever because that's going to be the reminder to me that I'm going to check my seatbelt. I'm going to make sure everything is sorted out and I'm going to be extra vigilant. Every team does it differently when you're talking about bringing new folks on board. So how many years did you spend on the team as a demo pilot? I, uh, as show team guy, I was uh, three years. Three years. So I'm guessing that last year you're starting to identify the new folks. You're training your relief, as we would say, in the Navy. Uh, well, no, you don't. So each year you, you put out a letter for candidates and then each year you'll do tryouts and you'll have certain replacements. And at that time, because of the transition from the tutor to the T6, um, we needed to retain people with tutor experience. We identified that. So we said, well, let's lengthen the tour a little bit. So instead of two years, you're going to do three years. And that way we can standardize things a little bit better and we'll have a, a smoother transition. That was a thought process that we had at the time. So then um, individuals were asked to come on the team. At that time on the team, on the second year, we the first time a female had made the team, Reese Carmichael, and she was a very talented pilot and she's a good friend. And, um, you know, so she came on the team. So we were going through all these different, um, you know, growth things so here we're doing this thing we just hire, we're hiring people the transitions are there we what you become concerned with is less about the you want people to do the best job that they can do and so you offer them as much advice without getting in the way and so there's some you know there's a real balance there and um as you know i moved into a standards and training role but i didn't want to be really what i wanted to be was the guy that just i wanted to if they have a problem 
or if they have a question, come to me. But I don't want to be in there going, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? It's very difficult to do that too, by the way, because sometimes it's just the take. It's what, you know, some people perceive it like that, but you're really not trying to do that. So you have to be careful about how you kind of tiptoe your way through that sort of thing. Um, You know, I really, what I enjoyed most about the job was, I mean, now, you know, I'd done the show team. It was a lot of fun. Now I'm working back at home. Um, maintaining the airplanes, you know, okay, hey, Rooster, we have an airplane that needs to be changed out in Fort Lauderdale. Can you bring us an airplane, swap it out, and then take that back here? And I'm like, all day long, I can do that. And then, you know, so that's what I end up doing, just flying around the country by myself, you know, maybe taking a tech with me or something, you know, going and picking up an airplane. Oh, yeah, I'll stay for the night. You know, you guys are having a fun time, it looks like, tonight. Would you mind if I hang out with you? Oh, no, no problem. Hang out. So I'd hang out and leave the next day, you know, and um, and then, you know, do what else I was doing. So it was kind of a really fun, um, you know, position to have at the end, really. You know, I changed my number from 9 to uh, 13, and I just remember somebody in ATC I came into tower and they said snowbird 13 and they go do you really want to be a snowbird 13 <laughs> I'm like well yeah that's me <laughs> yeah. the reason I mentioned that standards and training is so important it just it sounds very casual but you are literally said it you're you're such you're the I don't know, maybe gatekeeper is the wrong term but what is it uh, specifically what is it that you look for in new snowbirds what is it you look for the the clay that you need to mold into that aviator that's going to be in front of the world stage i'm guessing some people make the cut some people don't what's mm-hmm. that i maybe secret sauce is the wrong term but what's that that you look for in an aviator that's going to set them up for success on the team well there's i mean there's obviously there's a bar right so you have to make it this and and you know one of the book guys we used to laugh about it you say you don't have to be good you just have to be good enough and so you know it's quite simply that Are you, even if you're, we know that you're not going to show up and have everything. Some people do, and they're the, I mean, and they're, those are folks that are known, right? They, they're very good pilots, and they did very well. Um, They didn't need a whole lot of trying. They're just natural pilots. You know, those pilots exist. Cowboy was one of those guys. I just remember when he would roll on the wing in formation, he would like point roll and then come into formation. I mean, it was, it was literally unbelievable to watch that. Um, and I certainly, I, I don't, I know I wasn't able to be that smooth. It was never as consistent as that. So that to me is a natural AV. That's a naturally talented person that just has that ability and coordination and all the different things that come together. Um, so you either make that mark or you don't make that mark. And so you, you know, and this, you know, so for the folks that are really talented, the challenge for them is to realize when somebody isn't as talented. Um, and so you, you, a formation is only as good as its weakest member. Um, and you can't do anything more with that than that. You could have eight strongs one week. At, guess who drives the bus? The one, the, the weaker one, right? And he's not weak. He's just not as much there. So you have to take that into consideration and be wary of that. And that's a real challenge sometimes, too. That's another one of these things. But, um, you know, when we look at people, we look at things like uh, their ability to self-assess. We look at their ability to accept uh, responsibility for their errors and admit when they're wrong. Um, Don't try to project um, unless, you know, they say, well, I saw it like this. I mean, there's sometimes when you could say, ah, I saw it like that. This is what I, I mean, you go through it and you kind of pick it apart a little bit. Yeah, maybe you're, you know, it wasn't entirely on you, but maybe, you know, maybe you contributed to it. Uh, so there's an ability to do that and then to, to always want to be better and always want to be better. And then obviously the personal, the personality of the person, you know, how they get along with everyone. You know, you, you really, you're going on the road with everyone in close quarters for a long time. And, um, you know, God forbid if something happens, now you have to deal with a stressful situation. Just any day of the week, it's, it's hard enough, right? Because you're people wear thin on other people so you have to be respectful of people's space and all that sort of thing you learn a a lot of the a lot of the team dynamic and that's why you'll see you'll see a lot of people um that have participated in roles like that on not just on demo teams but on teams like that but talk let's talk demo teams then because i know people i see them on linkedin and stuff they're all motivational speakers they're all teaching companies how to do strategy meetings how to work together how to recognize your strengths your weaknesses and identify other people's strengths and weaknesses and how to throw all those things together and make like you say a secret sauce right that works for everyone um, because that allows you to grow, right? I mean, you never want to be limited. 
Um, and so there's a real, it's just, there's just a lot of stuff happening in there. And um, I'm sure, you know, you'd have some psychologists would have a heyday with it, right? Just trying to understand. I mean, they, they always, you know, oh, pilots are all type A. Well, yeah, t for the most part, but not really all the time. I don't, you know, it's not that you're not listening, you know, that I'm talking too much. You're just not listening, you know, so that sort of thing. It's very, very true. You mentioned, uh, I promise this is going to be, our, I think, our last Snowbird question before we move on to the rest of your uh, really exciting career. But as Snowbird 13, you didn't, you got to fly. You talked about flying the airplanes to, uh, you know, different locations and stuff. But one of the cool things that I uh, I know we talked about a little bit offline is when you're doing, you know, photo missions or whatever else. Yeah. It's got to be, it's not going to be someone inside the formation always. It's going to be you. Could you talk a little bit about the challenges and what's that, what that, that is entirely different from anything else I'm guessing you've done up to that point. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, that was one of the things that um, stepping into that and um, because the coordinators would do it too, um, up until that point, they'd do some of the simpler things. And we never really respected how good they were had to be to do that job. So we had to give them, and that was one of the training things that we brought in for the coordinators was, okay, guys, Let's put some math to this now. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the dynamic because you really flying outside where you're flying are really, I mean, you have the hardest job, right? We are already performance limited, but you're that far out of the formation. So f the physics of it demand that you have a way of putting your airplane where it needs to be. So you need to be thinking about that. And then, you know, you have to understand when to back out of a situation. So the photo shot itself doesn't become the primary objective. It's the safety of, the, of that getting yourself where you need to be thinking about it before and if in the setup you start to see it going down a road where you don't think it's going to end well speak up and say something you know because you know on the on the coordinator side or on the photo platform side it's easy for them to feel like well I can't say anything these are the team guys they're the gods I mean I'm not going to tell them they're screwing up I must be screwing up no 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 that's not it if the setup may be wrong something you know and everybody will appreciate that um, if you come out and say it. Now, choose the words carefully how you say it. Don't say, hey, you're messing up. You know, to say, hey, can we reset on this? I think I'm just a little out of position, but did you maybe run in a little quicker than you said you were? You know, that type of thing. So try to make something constructive out of it. Sounds exciting. As a photographer, it's the kind of stuff I love to do. Sure. So it's, yeah. uh, it's challenging, I'm telling you. I, and I'm, I, I'm not just saying that. I, that is some of the, and I've seen it not end well in some cases. There's been some close calls. Uh, where we've had to reset um, the dynamics of airplanes in formation, for example. There's a very famous one that if you go back, you the XB-70 and the F-4 and the 104 and all those airplanes are in that gaggle. Um, and you see what happens there, right? Um, you know, you really have to understand how airplanes interact with one another and step into it very easy. You may be, you may be close to one another, but if you go just an inch closer, it could be the cliff, right? And so something bad can happen. For sure. It's something I respect, and a lot of times people will uh, very kindly congratulate <clears throat> me. That's a great photo. That's a really cool video, and I will say, no, it is not me. I press the button. Uh, to p the people have to get the airplanes in that position to make it happen. I'm just fortunate enough to get to witness it and share it with you. But truly, the respect all goes to, and I say this as a pilot who flies formation for fun in my little my uh, airplane that my brother and I own, and uh, obviously for work in the T-6 and then, you know, prior in the 53. You understand the dynamic so much better when you're an aviator yourself. Yeah. So it's uh, it's something to respect, and I think it's it's a lot of fun. It makes a great result. People get to share and, and see something neat, but by the same time, uh, one of the things I always have in the brief, no photo is worth an accident. It's just it's never exactly. worth it, yep. especially when you're thinking about That's it afterwards. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So uh, we, I'm, I'm looking at the list of things I want to ask you about. We've only gone maybe halfway down it because the next thing you did after the Snowbirds is, in my mind, even more exciting. So where'd you go next? Uh, so I got, I was kind of in a spot where they really wanted me to go to a, a ground tour and I should have, you know, they, I mean, I was due and uh, I just really didn't want to. I mean, I didn't, the job that was being offered in Ottawa at the National Defense Headquarters, like going to the Pentagon, I guess, and you just don't know what's going to happen at the end where you get lost in the shuffle or, you, you know, you, you, thing about aging is you, you're, you're always aging, right? So am I aging myself out of potential positions? And so... <clears throat> You know, who knows where I would have went if I would have went to Ottawa. We just, I just never went down that road. I said, well, I really don't want to do that. And um, fortunately, there was, um, when I was flying as Snowbird, you know, as a standards and training officer, um, the Aerospace and Engineering Test Establishment um, called us up 
and asked us if we could support a dissimilar formation team that they were doing. And they had nobody to fly their Tudor airplane. And it was all in their specific colors. And they were flying with a T6 with the round engine Texan, like, and a T33 and a Tudor. So three vastly different airplanes. And so anyways, I was asked if I would come up and fly for them, which I did. And that was a really good experience. Well, the, the, the CEO of the squadron, he was um, <clears throat> a colonel. Bill Werney was a very aggressive guy. He was like a bulldog. He said to me, he goes, hey, so what are you doing? And I go, I think I'm getting out of the military. They want me to go to Ottawa. I don't really want to go. I think I'm just going to release. And, you know, I'm, I'm maybe try to join an airline. I called up a few friends that were at a couple of the, uh, the domestic airlines in Canada, and they'd say, yeah, yeah, for sure. You can come, come work for us, and, you know, or at least we'll throw your name in the pile. And so um, I was considering doing that, and he said, well, what's your back? Like, what have you done? And I said, well, you know, I did this and this. And he goes, what's your educational background? And um, we talked about this a little bit before, and I said, well, I have a degree in physics. And he goes, really? And he goes, have you ever thought about being a test pilot? And I went, well, I thought about it for like four minutes, but, I, you know, I thought I need to do this and all these things, and I would love to be a test pilot. And he goes, yeah, you should come up here and... Uh, um, and do the tryout. You had to do a tryout for that. You had to go up and fly different airplanes, and then they give you a couple projects. And it was, you know, and I obviously had a lot of hours at that time and a lot of experience, so they didn't know what to do with me, really. They go, he's not going to struggle flying, I don't think, really. So what are we going to do to him? So they, it was almost like they were trying to set, like, a minefield for me, right, so that I could, you know, mess up or something. But anyways, and I probably didn't look the best. I mean, it was like doing a bunch of bookwork stuff. I don't excel at that. I've never been a staff guy traditionally. I mean, I'm okay at it. I'm just not great. And that's self-admission right there. But um, anyways, so he said, well, come up and do the tryout. So I came up, and there's um, three of us, um, and we went through the uh, went through the, the two-week uh, selection and um, at the end of it they said yeah okay it'll work um, they were concerned because it had been literally a decade since I'd been in school the other guys it was like you know like typically in the military in the U, in the USAF I mean these guys they have like masters and in some case doctorates and stuff and they're like 29 you know here I come in I'm like you know 38 years old or whatever coming off this you know, just flying and everything. So how am I going to do? And so, uh, but I went to I went to Edwards. It was a great experience, and um, I, I passed. I did. Well, I I didn't finish at the bottom. Didn't finish at the top. I was kind of bordering maybe on the top there. I did well in some of the flying tests and stuff. So I was quite proud of myself. And so successful. And and then went to uh, AT and uh, was a multi-engine slash. I did a lot of flying on the Tudor that we had there too. So I did you know different airframes that we had in the inventory up in Canada. Before we get away from Edwards, <clears throat> I know very little about the Navy Test Pilot School. I know almost nothing about the Air Force side. Yeah. What airplanes do you fly? I think there's the F-16, the T-38. There's a couple that everyone flies, it seems like. But what's just a very quick, broad brush strokes looking at uh, in the, the curriculum that you went through at Edwards Air Force Base? So the way, so the way Test Pilot School works, um, they want or they, they find benefits at, at Edwards specifically, because every school is a little different. Um, they all get to the same end point, but they kind of have a different course that they take. And at Edwards, it was more, we want to take you out of your comfort zone and put you somewhere where you're not as comfortable and see how you deal with it. Um, so you fly three different airplanes. There's the F-16s, uh, T-38, and the King Air. Um, fighter, uh, experienced fighter people will they'll jump in T-38 and the King Air and some of the F-16 um, if you came from a larger airplane. So they, well, they went off your operational tour. For me, it was like, oh, it's Snowbirds, I guess, and then E-3. So they said, well, we'll say you're, I was going to fill a multi-engine slot at, at, air, at test establishment in Cold Lake, so that's what we we're going to focus on. So I was flying the T-38 and the F-16 and the King Air. So, you know, and the F-16, I mean, my God, you know, you jump in this thing, and I mean, it's like... A, goes like a scalded cat you know and I mean going uphill 30,000 feet a minute is ridiculous I mean it's just it, un, unbelievable and um, you know so they, they really do try to get you but they're the whole philosophy of 
their approach to it was, we want you to fly as much as you can. We find there's much more value at it. The Navy's approach, having known some friends that went through that, it's more on, ah, oh, you better learn how to write these reports, and you do this, and you, you know. So it's a little bit more heavy on the engineering slash reporting side. Um, so is Edwards. I mean, you do a lot of reports, but you really do focus on the flying. So I flew, I mean, I think I flew like 25 different, I mean, ridiculous amount of airplanes, right? Both F-15E and D and the F-16, obviously, and then uh, F-18. And you fly, you go, flew Alpha Jets overseas. You go on these crazy trips and do stuff. I mean, one one day they offered somebody the opportunity to go fly, like, the Goodyear blimp. And I'm like, you know, that sounds like fun, actually. But I'm not so sure I'd want to get, you know, be the, have the job. Um, but yeah, you know, the idea I'm guessing is variety. The more different types you see, the more different. That's the focus. Yeah. It's to, it's to put you into something that's different. You do tests on her. I did a test on a, on a albatross, like a twin engine flying, flying boat. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah, yeah. We did a test on that. Me and this FT and we went through the profile and study. We did well on this flight and he was, you know, it, it's just, it, and what it does is it opens your eyes and that's what the life of a tester forget about all of the the impression of oh yeah you're here you're a test pilot you must be great no you're okay you're probably above average to high average in terms of talent but where you're you really earn your keep and where you really is your focus on and attention to detail and knowing how to draw out the characteristics of an airplane a lot of people will jump into a car and go I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's a test pilot job, okay? That's what test pilots do. They get in and go, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. And um, and other tests will focus in on certain things. And, you know, yeah, there's some decidedly risky points to being a tester, particularly in performance and handling qualities when you're doing envelope expansion and that sort of thing, or you're doing, uh, you know, VMCG determination and things like that. Those things can... Re they, they can get very bad very quickly. So you just start to gather up, once again, in aviation, you just build the toolkit. You go through, you listen to the people that know the job, that have been there before, that have done things. You, um, you know, everything in test flying is done in a very methodical approach. That's what Edwards and that's what the Navy Test Pilot School teaches you. They teach you to brief the card and fly the card. Don't go off the card. If you see something that doesn't look right, stop come back down to the ground and talk about it with the engineers because they're going to tell you that hey, maybe you found something there that's your job right um, and so it's a, a different discipline that you're kind of opening up into there's the bravado certainly it was much more dangerous back in the day I mean if you read any of the stories you know you know Chuck Yeager and all these you know Scott Crossfield and all these folks Neil Armstrong all of them I mean tremendous amount of like they didn't know how it would go and um you know we're kind of not, now we're a lot better at what we do we th we have more prescribed um you know uh, flight test guides for the maneuvers themselves um you know like right now i'm a production test pilot i got out of the developmental side from the previous employer now working as a production test pilot and one of the things that I say to the other pilots is just because this is production doesn't mean it's less risky. I mean, if anything, you are on guard for everything. People, um, because humans are involved, there's always an introduction of something that can get you somewhere you don't want to be. And so there's a certain level of discipline that you need. Um, you know, production test flying is not any different than anything else. We see things in airplanes. You know the unknown part when you when you fly in a developmental airplane is that it's all unknown. It's just based on predictions, and so you're going up there and you're going, okay, are you validating what the predictions were, or if you see something that wasn't entirely what you expected, there's probably something they haven't considered, so it's probably time to stop. You mentioned multi-engine flying. So when you came back from Edwards, went back to Canada, what was your primary uh, platform that you flew on? It was kind of some of the test work that you did. So when I came back. Um, I was put onto the CP140, which is the Aurora P3, uh, which has um, been in service with Canada for a number of years now. And, um, you know, we were doing what they call block upgrades. Um, 
which is a fancy way of saying we have this much money for this block, we have this much money for this block, and so we're going to do a block upgrade. And so you go through these different levels of blocks. And so I got in, it was mostly avionics work. Um, then they were adding some, uh, some changing some shapes on the airplane, so introducing uh, some ESM type gear onto the wingtips. And they were also working on some of the weapons deliveries on this, the airplane itself. And, um, you know, so lots of different things, but um, it, not as exciting as it is in the civilian side, you know. Um, I also flew on the, the, buff, the, the Havlin <clears throat> Buffalo, which we still flew, which is a turboprop bus. I mean, unbelievably capable airplane. I mean, one thing to Havlin knew how to do is build an airplane that could literally land on a postage stamp. And so that was an exciting airplane to fly. Um, you know, so I did that for about four four years and change and um, learned a lot of, learned a lot of stuff. You know, you, you always learn something, right? And that's the thing, just realize that you're learning. If you don't, if you're not coming to work and kind of, not every day I'm saying, but if you're not going to work and coming back and going, oh, man, you know, that was interesting today. Um, maybe we could do that a little bit better. Still that happens. I, I mean, today I flew, I mean, I. You, could we have done that a little better? Yeah, I think we probably could have. So let's do it like this next time. Okay. And, you know. Um, that's what keeps you interested. That keeps it interesting, I'm guessing. That's it. And that, and also, you never know, you know, you know, everything is great when the day is good and, you know, sun is bright and everything's going as per plan. You're always training for that day when it doesn't go that well, when things don't follow the plan, when things go off the side, when something is not playing well with other, something else, right? And you're having to sit there and go, okay, now let's just stop this from happening. Let's try to figure out what's going on and, and how we're going to recover this and get back to where we need to be. And, you know, in most cases, just stop the trip at that point. But every day is different. And, um, you know, you're always learning. I mean, it, it, we always say that if you've stopped learning, then you should stop flying. But it really is true. And, um, you know, I just don't see a point. There's so much out there to do in airplanes that there's, you can't possibly learn everything. I mean, the secret is to know that you just don't know everything. That's it. I, I will say one thing that uh, maybe isn't a secret, but one of the things I've always found interesting. I did my master's in flight test engineering. Okay. Two years. I don't know if you heard the University of Tennessee Space Institute, UTSI, yep. up in Tennessee. Unfortunately, the program totally. is, is gone now. Oh, sadly. is it? Yeah. Uh, Rich Renato, does that name ring a bell from Bombardier? Yep. Mm -hmm. He was one of my uh, one of the gentlemen I, I say worked with. I worked for, just to be very clear. But uh, all that to mention before going there, before knowing folks who were test pilots, like you mentioned, that Chuck Yeager, Scott Crossfield, Neil Armstrong, you have these impressions in your mind of who test pilots are. Um, <laughs> You're a test pilot. And today when we walked in, I'll just tell a little story. He did a first flight on an airplane. Literally the first time this airplane ever broke deck and got airborne. And you said it so casually as if it was nothing at all. Because it probably was, right? But to someone with that experience, no drama is good. That's what you, You're not out there, you know, coming back. Uh, gosh, what did, uh, what did Maverick come back, you know, in his spacesuit all burned up after oh, yeah. ejecting at Mach 10? That's not reality. What reality is, is like you said, you know, knowing what those risks are, you fall back on your experience. You fall back on your training and making the right decision. But you also make it look like it's almost nothing at all, at least to the outside observer. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's flying the plan, right? Uh, we have a flight test plan that we use, and we have a very professional crew. And, we have, and, and really, the, the flight test engineer who sits in between the two pilots he is the test conductor. He drives the show. I don't do anything until he says to do that um, or to do what they want to do. They go through the script. We go through it, and it's very it's disciplined. And in some ways, even though you've done it numerous times, you still go through that process, and it's important to do that. You never want to make it so that you're diverting from it because, oh, wow, I thought it was a little monotonous. No, it's never monotonous. If it's monotonous, it's time to go do something else. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. the respect for it that that experience brings, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's very structured, and you'll find yourself, you know, I've been on some, you know, you do flutter testing and things like that, and, um, you know, you're out there, and you're putting, you have to be very careful. You have telemetry on the ground that's watching the airplane. You're going out there and moving the airplane into some of these areas where it's never been before. Um, it's very structured, right? And so you have exciters that are out there that try to trip off. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you put a code in and it's this duration or dwell time or whatever, however you want to phrase it for the, you know, this length of time. And so, um, you know, what did it result in? 
So speaking of those steely-eyed test pilots, sometimes there's television cameras around. I know something you you get to do kind of unique work with the Discovery Channel when you're up at uh, Cold Lake. Could you talk a to us a little bit about that? So when I was on the Snowbirds, um, they did an hour-long program on us. Um, I think it was uh, one of the TV channels, like the CBC or whatever. And, uh, and so that's like the National Broadcasting Corporation. And one of the chaps that was in this, his name was Mark Miller, and he's a good friend of mine now. And, and at the time, when they were doing the production, I was being the operations officer, I was kind of allegating airplanes. So I was kind of the belly button for him to get. If he wanted to get an airplane and the boss was okay with it, and he seemed to be all the time, he would come to me and I would get him an airplane. And so we built up this relationship and stuff and uh, maintained this friendship. And um, so, Mark, there was a TV show that was going in Europe. Um, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden was doing a thing with Discovery and it was a flying show. He's like a, a, a totally legitimate pilot. And, um, and you know, I think he even flies her 7-4 around, I think. Well, I'm not sure on that. Um, but I do know he's rated in large aircraft and that. So he's he's got skills. And so, um, anyways, he was doing a show and it got to be too much and they, they got rid of it. Well, they wanted to discovery canada civilization it was called it was discovery it was a subsidiary of discovery canada they said hey we would like to replicate that show so mark's idea was you know he approached me he said we want to do a tv show and here's what it's going to be it's going to be an experienced guy and a non-experienced guy so i've got a couple hundred hours which he did and you've got like a whole pile of hours and so you and i are going to go do these things in airplanes and we're going to see you know if we could challenge one another and so, and we called it Air Dogs. And, and so, anyways, so the first thing we did was I got it together with some of the friends that I know from the air show industry from my time on the Snowbirds. And one particular gentleman named Ken Peach, who's he just got done flying at Oshkosh, and he's he's a he's a current air show guy. Um, he, one of the things he does is he lands an airplane on the top of an RV, and so we're like, well, let's go do that. And so we did. That was our first TV show. And so, and then we went from there. We flew with another uh, friend of mine that owns uh, some Russian airplanes, Yak, Yak 55 and stuff like that. So we flew those. And then it ended up going places we never thought it would. We did like two seasons. It got to be a lot of work. I mean, anybody that thinks that people in, in a TV show don't work hard is crazy i mean it is like it is 16 18 hour days probably a lot like what even what you're doing right now i'm sure takes a lot of time to edit and do add television into it and it's it's even much more so we did a lot of that and then um you know it flew with kirby shambliss red bull guy we you know flew a lot of warbird stuff lancaster bomber p51 mustangs we did a very thing I don't know where the show is now. It got sold and stuff, and it was, you know, it was a long time ago, so I apologize for that um, in terms of some of the animation and stuff like that. It's not where stuff is today. Uh, so it's a very, uh, what I would consider to be, um, you know, uh, let's say not a very up-to-date. There's no CGI, right? Sure, sure. So it's just a little different. But the flying was real, and the cameras that we put on the airplanes were real. And what we captured on camera was real. And so, you know, we were going out there and really flying the airplanes, and there was no going back and editing things out for the purpose of making something disappear. We experienced real-type experiences on the airplanes. You know, we flew the, um, you know, all sorts of airplanes. I mean, when I go back and think about it, the uh, Starship, the Beechcraft Starship, we flew that. Um, Such a beauty. Such a good-looking airplane. Unbelievable airplane. I mean, so advanced for its time, and you get into it, and, you know, like, so being a test guy, I look at the avionics, and I'm like, oh, my God, Collins actually had an electronic checklist at the time. I mean, the thing, the tube that it was in was about as long as your arm you know, behind the deep panel. Deep into the panel, yeah. Deep yeah. into the panel, but, you know, and, and so there's a weight penalty with that, obviously. Uh, but anyways, the airplane itself was just a real stable machine and cool as heck to see. I mean, I remember looking out of it and seeing my shadow on the ground going, we were flying in a Mojave. Um, and uh, I just remember thinking, wow, what a unique shape of an airplane. And uh, it looked like something like prehistoric, you know what I'm saying? 
anyways, just to really, you know, so we did a lot of that sort of thing. And, um, and Mark actually, he forged his way across. Some of his stuff is on TV a lot. Like, you know, he did uh, Highway Through Hell. Have you ever seen that? I have, that? yeah. So yeah. that's his show. Huh. So, and they came up with that idea. So he's a very, very, um, you know, good at coming up with these types of things. He just has that mind. He's a, he's kind of a brilliant guy. And, um, and so it was a lot of fun to do that. And that's one of those opportunities that came about just from doing stuff, you know, on the snowbirds and you have this chance meeting and really ta- it teaches you that, you know, the relationships that you make, you have to be, you never know where they can go. Yep. And so that's the thing. And it was, it's, you never know who you can share opportunities with either. That that Rolodex, a professional Rolodex of folks that you know, uh, it's not, I don't know, some people seem to think it's, you know, maybe a negative thing, you know, you're using. No, you're not. You're, you're trying to hopefully connect good people with other good people and you never know where it's going to, you know, what it's going to lead to in the future. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the conversations you have and stuff, and I'm not out there, you know, I, I'm very kind of quiet about what I, you know, I just like hanging around airplanes exactly I really yeah. do I, I i spend my day out at the hangar working on my airplane and i you know fly the airplane and i like doing it i like going to work and flying for sure i can understand why you've got a got a lot of a little bit of experience i guess i should say yeah. i'm guessing when we talk about cold lake that's the end of the military career for you yeah how many years in total 23 23 years 23 yeah. years uh looking back 23 years later actually i'm guessing we have a little bit more time than that now since since the end since you uh, retired what would you do differently anything at all i really can't say i would do anything differently i just i because you don't know what different means right and um you know maybe if i wanted to do if i took that trail and you know you go do something else on a different you know say you're flying you know guys go fighters or maybe they didn't want to do that you know the the astronaut program i do have some friends that really wanted to do that i think that would be great but then i i I have a friend um he made it into the program it was very competitive and um so he's been in houston now for in excess of i'll say 13 14 years and he has yet to go to space and um so he's you know he's working hard at it i mean this isn't like it was back in the 60s and 70s when it's aggressive posturing to go do these things and you read the books about it and you go they really wanted to get this done now you go there and you're you know you're just you're kind of just i'm not taking anything away from it but you know if that's what you wanted to do you'd really want to be able to go to space so at the height of the program when the shuttle was flying i there was one of the guys that worked with us at bombardier um who was a shuttle guy and um sam gamar and and he you know he taught i mean that's what he talked about obviously it's a high point of his life right but he did like four shuttle missions right or i mean this he over and over again but not like he didn't spend 13 years just flying around in a t-38 doing pr tours and stuff like that and that just kind of seems to be where they're at right now they're kind of a little bit of a a lull. There's lots of opportunities there. I think it's super interesting, and I'm sure that I get beaten up for it if any Chris Hadfield or one of these guys was around me or something. Anyone you look up to, anyone in your, and obviously we're not wrapping up the interview entirely yet, but I'm just kind of focusing on the military time. Did you have folks that were mentors as an aviator, as an officer, people you say, hey, that's who I want to be, I jokingly say, when I grow up, but as I continue to advance as a a pilot, was there anyone that kind of stood out to you in your time in the military? Yeah, there was was quite a a few, and I mean, if I'm going to name drop, you know, like there's a chap, Mick Lebolis, um, and they called him Hog because he, was, he, he used to famously say he'd rather have front seats than friends. But he was a very positive influence. And um, for a bunch of different reasons, but mostly because it was, you know, when you have these young guys and girls, but, you know, guys tend to be a little bit more aggressive in, in some ways. Um, when you have a lot of very aggressive personalities, we'll say, that just are eager to they're like mustang horses you got to know how to handle a mustang horse right and how to how to corral them and how to make sure that they don't get out and cause mayhem Um, because it can easily happen that way you have a lot of young people that are given a lot of responsibility and you know sometimes that can take um be they can be irresponsible with it he really did have a unique way of keeping people understanding that hey this is this is what you're going to do for now, and this is, you know, this is how you're going to handle yourself, and this is what you can look forward to. But I can promise you that this is a finite tour, and so before you know it, it's going to be over. And so we really did impart a lot of really good things. The other fellow um, was 
the first chief pilot at Bombardier, his name was Chuck Ellis. Um, I really liked Chuck a lot because I always thought that he was a very selfless person. Like he, you know, it wasn't about he was a chief pilot, but he was also the person that would allocate different responsibilities for different things. And he was never, he was very selfless in that. Like he recognized that, you know, I, I have to keep on training people because I have a finite time as a chief pilot. And I may be tra training another chief pilot, so I'm trying to impart on them these experiences. But there's been a lot of people like that. And, uh, you know, I could keep on talking. Um, everybody, I think, has had an influence on me in some way, shape, or form. After getting out of the Air Force, where'd you go next? So, um, <clears throat> so when I got out of the Air Force, I was, you know, I was looking for a job outside of the military. And, um, you know, in Canada, there's, there's aerospace, there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, um, but most of them reside with a lot of the companies, Canada Air de Havilland, all of them kind of merged together and they kind of came out as Bombardier Aerospace, which actually Bombardier started out as building snowmobiles, oddly enough. But then, you know, they, the way things go typically is they, they kind of, you know, morphed into this thing where they, they became this, this pretty much the, the banner for aerospace in Canada. Um, most of it on the regional jets and, um, and business jets on the Canada Challenger, that sort of thing. Um, and so anyways, what the opportunity was, was to come out. I, I got a call. Um, I was actually, it was interesting. I was in a drive through at a coffee sh shop and my phone rang and we were doing a project on the de Havilland Buffalo and we were almost at the end of it. And my flight test engineer, who was this old, crusty French Canadian guy, Raz, was sitting there with me. And so the phone came out. I didn't recognize the number. So I just answered it. And um, you, know, you can always hear what's going on on the other side, typically. And it's Chuck Ellis. And he goes, hi, this is Chuck Ellis. And, you know, I'm calling because I think, you know, we'd like to talk to you about maybe coming and working for us. And Raz was sitting next to me and he goes, not before we're done this project. He said that out loud, right? And I go, apparently not before we're done this project. And he got a little chuckle out of that. But that, that was the next job. So I went and interviewed with them. And, and the position I was doing was moving to Montreal um, and... Um, and working as the, a test pilot on the C-Series program at the time, which was a brand new airplane that the company was building. It was, you know, large pod-mounted engines, kind of like looks, looked a lot like, you know, the typical uh, 737 or Airbus 320, except, you know, those types. Um, so anyways, I uh, took the job, moved to Montreal with the family, and because uh, I'm married now, and um, and we um, we set up, uh, got a house there, and I worked on the program. And at that time, I was working mostly in the design. We didn't physically have an airplane yet. We were just going through with the, you know, the different design phases and the milestones that you meet. And we were making lots of big decisions and stuff. And so it's a really interesting and unique opportunity at the time and one you don't really consider because, well, I'm not flying right now. I'm doing this. I'm doing a desk job. So... You know, something I tried my best to avoid when I was in the military is some. This is my first job, is really working in a ground job. But I got to fly every now and then, um, you know, on certain missions and that that they were doing on test aircraft. But most of it was working on the airplane, and um, so I did that and uh, moved through. And slowly the program was morphing, and, and they said. You know, the flight test facility for Bombardier was in Wichita, Kansas, where Cessna is. And, uh, you know, it's like a mecca for aviation in, the U in, in North America. And so, uh, you know, I said, hey, we'd like to move down to Wichita. I know I'm giving up a spot on the C-Series program once we get to the first flight because we were building, you know, s up to seven flight test vehicles for the program. And, uh, and you know, I didn't. It's, it's a tough decision, but it's one that you have to make mostly in some cases for the family and in other cases because you just want to get that move done and get down there in the flight test facility. I thought I'd spent my time working working in the design phase long enough and I wanted to participate more in flying, active flying. I felt like I was losing a bit of my skills. So um, so I did that. We moved down there and um, and started flying, started flying on business jets. Uh, on the Challenger, did uh, first flight on Challenger 350, and then, um, you know, doing work on some other airplanes. You kind of, we don't, we, they're all experimental airplanes, right? So anybody can fly them. So you just kind of move around and, you know, um, you, you fly the different, it's a, it's a really cool experience. And, um, and so I did that. And then, uh, 
And then the C series now was coming up, and they were getting ready. And so an opportunity came up to take uh, you know a lead position on one of the flight test vehicles. So I did that on FTV three, and um, and then other opportunities within the program. But basically went along with the program, and when it went into entry into service and got its certification, which is a massive milestone. And then obviously you know in all the different first flights that go along with all the different flight test vehicles, and then when the airplane you know was being flown by other airlines and you're starting to see this airplane graduate from the design phase to now production it's in service and then your friends are starting to fly on it and you're getting hey man i just flew on that thing it's really nice you know and um so you're getting all this type of feedback so it's a really it's a neat place to be and not one that not everyone gets to experience it is in flight tests you know sometimes you just got to hit it right um Unfortunately, you know, there were some issues with the finances in the company and stuff like that, and Airbus came on the picture, and they took over the program, renamed it the A220, and I really, you know, and so for me, it was a natural progression to follow the airplane along, and I really did want to, because it really is one of my favorite airplanes, and um, so we moved to Mobile, to the facility here, and uh, that was about two and a half years ago. And then, you know, so fly both the 320, 321s and the 220. Um, But just that whole experience has been in itself really different and, you know, quite quite fun, actually. And, um, you know, just... um, it, it just it's like it's it's like a person's life right it just it's kind of you you start out young like you know you have students you're teaching and then they graduate and then you see them go on to this and you know you're just it's kids you know and and so your your experience in flying can somewhat be like that and so uh, and that's what this is like a mutual friend of ours who you know who you know who I'm talking about has mentioned that the beauty of flying with you and having your experience follow that airplane is that when someone might ask a question hey why does the I do this and this happens not only do you understand why this happens you understand why a design decision was made and why the why of it not just a plus b yeah. equals c why does a plus b equals c right. and that that institutional knowledge um for those that haven't been part of it or haven't seen something like that man when you lose it it is it is so painful to regain it so it's so valuable when you get to keep it and so valuable that yeah you share that with airbus and on the other folks that you uh, you work with and fly with yeah it, to me it was you know some people would take that experience of you know it's like two like it's like uh uh, say, for example, two airlines merging together. One's going to be the winner, one's going to be the loser, if you want to say it like that. In this case, it was like, well, it could always be like that, but why it doesn't need to be like that. And so, you know, my job is, you know, part of my job, a big part of my job is to make sure that uh, as much of the technical transfer of knowledge, and trust me, I don't know everything about that airplane. I know some of the lineage of things. I know some of the decisions we made. Um, and a lot of the big decisions we were always part of, but you know, if you don't know it, you know where to get it. And so I, I particularly do that with customers because they're going to ask questions. They go, "Hey, this is not like this," because you know the A320 does this. Why is the A220 like this? And and well, it's because it's got a different lineage. Okay, it has a different philosophy in some cases applied to it. It's just another approach. It doesn't make it. It just makes it different. Um, and maybe better, maybe, but certainly not worse. And um, and so, anyways, that's what these things tend to be. And you know, and that's the thing. I learn a lot from, you know, the f- other guys I fly with a lot, right? Because I go in there sometimes, and I, I'm a human like everyone else. And so, jump into an A320, and sometimes I don't want to say it's an Easter egg hunt to find a button, but you know, sometimes you're like, because it change. You know, we have lots of different features on the airplanes uh, that come in they're growth items right they're more capability and that's what i really like about airbus i'll say it right now because they are really interested in making a very good product right um so the product leaves a factory in 1985 or 1986 or 1990 but that's not where it stops they keep on wanting to make it better and so, um, you know, they're always in, in the interest of making pilots. And one of the, I can't say I came up with this, but he says, you know, when pilots get lost, they tend to stay lost unless you can get them back. It's true. And we don't want people to get lost. So we're always striving to work through and make an airplane that's that much better than everybody else's. I mean, 
and the other the, the other manufacturers are just as good there's I'm not going to pick any you know I'm not picking favorites I'm obviously slightly biased but I have had the opportunity to see at least two or three different manufacturers airplanes and there's lots of pluses and minuses but I definitely like the the approach of trying to make the airplane better and make the features better and not make it harder on the pilot to fly it's all about giving them the workload that they need you know so they don't get lost and they don't stay lost and if they do get lost you can bring them back bring them home yeah yeah of course one thing you kind of you uh, ran past in a moment ago I want to return to you mentioned doing first flights on uh, on these airplanes and actually before I even get into that I want to point out something you also said very casually uh, they're all experimental airplanes so again like you mentioned you don't have to have a type rating or a type certificate yet they don't even exist it's an experimental jet right. which is pretty darn unique even just you know thinking about it that way but uh, what is it like to do a first flight and what I mean a first flight like the first time this airplane is flying um, I know when I uh, purchased uh, an RV6. Yes, it, it it was a first flight to me in that it was my first time in the left seat without an instructor pilot. It made my first solo, I guess I should say. But at the end of the day, I knew the airplane flew. I knew it, it had already been validated by plenty of other people. It had many hours on it before I got into it. You don't necessarily know any of that, or maybe you do to a different extent. What's I'm, I'm just curious. What's that headspace like when you're when you're breaking deck for the first time in this in an airplane? Well, a lot of times, I, if you're doing a clean sheet, um, you know you. I, there's several iterations of um, simulations and all sorts of stuff that you've ran through, and and really that first flight. And you, let's use the RV. You know, somebody makes a home-built airplane. Yeah, it's a Vans airplane. Yeah, it's got it's. There's hundreds of them out there, but every airplane is built probably a little differently. And you know, depending on how good you are at building the airplane, it could have different characteristics. And so you try to keep that first flight into as small a space as you possibly can. You want to stay in the heart of the envelope. You don't want to go out to the edges. You don't need to go out to the edges, um, at least not on that first flight. So you try to control the actual, you know, you put a test card together. It's very structured. You know, obviously take off. You may do some high-speed taxi tests or something like that. Um, but you try to control it so that it doesn't become too much of a, you know, you try to get as much done as you can that's, that's uh, safe and practical. But, you know, you'll typically see nobody will raise the gear initially. They'll, you know, leave the configuration of the airplane as is for a little while until they gather some data and they figure it out. And then they may push out to the edges a little bit more. And each time you fly another airplane of that same, you know, you have five that are built. There's variants in all of those airplanes. Um, you, you're moving out a little bit more. And the program hasn't even gotten there yet, right? You're just, because, you know, in order to keep, to do a flight test program and get it done in a manageable amount of time so you can make money, um, you can't do it with one airplane. You need four or five airplanes, right? You need one for handling qualities, you need one for systems, you need one for performance, you need one for avionics usually, and you need a, a functional and reliability airplane so that you can kind of check the robustness of the design later on. So you have all these airplanes concurrently flying, right? Um, and each one of them is is offering something to the program that allows the other airplanes to go further. So systems airplane is seeing some of the, you know, whatever they're working on, the performance ones certainly for data and, and stuff like that. But, you know, to get back to your original question, a first flight, and this is the thing about it's almost like it's it, it almost doesn't compute really, but you've done so much planning and so much rehearsals and so much um, participation with um, the um, you know all of the different engineering disciplines flight sciences and all that sort of thing that you kind of you kind of get a sense for what's going to happen and you know there's some maneuvers and some airplanes that you just have to be very wary of you know steady heading side slips and things like that can tend to upset an airplane if you're not looking for the right things and um, or if you don't stop the testing uh, when you're supposed to performance is is very risky too on the ground on the runway um, you know so you just you, you, everything is a building block approach it's and it you know it, and the other thing that's behind you is that nattering programmatic this is a revenue operation let's keep that in mind yeah we have to be safe but we're not risk averse you know so you're accepting a, a certain level it's like smart risk if you will um, so how far are we going to go to get the data that we need without exposing anybody to undue risk. 
we can't stop the program, but we certainly have, to, you know, and we have to keep it going. So it, it's just, it's a, it's a balance. And, you know, that's one of the things they teach in test pilot school. One of the, you know, the elements that they go through is, oh yeah, the program office is wanting to do this and this, right? Go do this, go, go in your, your, your 53 and go air to air refueling. And nobody's done that yet. You're going to clear the envelope for air to air refueling for speeds on the tanker or whatever, or, the, or investigate the boom character or the drogue characteristics. You know, it, it's just one of these things. And you always, so you always have this barking dog behind you and you just kind of have to learn how to you know, work through all that, but at the same time recognize that everybody has different uh, different milestones. Everyone always asks, answers this question differently, but as a test pilot, I know it's probably a def- definitely an unfair question. Uh, looking back, the stable of airplanes that you've had the privilege to fly, and it, it seems like, a, gosh, you mentioned the Lancaster, the Mustang, yeah. uh, just so many neat airplanes. Uh, I'm going to ask you to pick a favorite. I know there's no, there's no defined mission. It's just uh, something that you as an aviator uh, puts a smile on your face when you fly that machine. You've, you've flown so many, but can you, you pin it down to one? It's a tough question because it's almost like you have to define a certain parameter. That sure, and what, I can. What air, yeah, you can define it. You're, so you're the like, test pilot. <laughs> I mean, like, well, the P-51 and was a cool airplane um, to fly just because of the sound um, and the way it flew, and it was so balanced. And, and one thing is once you fly a certain amount of airplanes, you start to look back to Lancaster, for example, got to fly that a little bit. And, um, you know, y- y- when you look at the airplanes and you look at when they were designed, okay, and flown, f- let's take the Lancaster. So you have a four-engine airplane that's going to carry a whole heck of a lot of, of bombs, and you're putting a small crew in it, have one pilot, um, and you're going to put a bunch of them in formation at night, and these guys are going to fly these airplanes and go across and do this. And you're only 30 to 40 years after the first flight, okay, of anything. And you and you look at the airplane and you go, this is amazingly technologically sound for that period of time. They made the compromises that they had to make. That's the thing that struck me on that airplane. It was so well balanced um, in terms of the control response. It just flew nice and um, very stable, big wing on it, you know. And uh, and there's no sound like flashing up for Merlins. You know, you're just kind of, holy crap, this is like, is that ever neat? And all those airplanes were, that was a thing that I kind of take away from. And I look at them and I go, man, this, there's a lot of thought that went into this. And then at the same time, you go and advances in airplanes now. It's really hard for me to say this is my favorite airplane. One of my favorite airplanes is the Challenger 350. I just think it was just such a balance of power and just handling qualities and just a nice airplane to fly. I just loved flying that airplane. It has so much excess thrust. I mean, God, get up to 43,000 feet in a heartbeat. Um, You know, just a cool airplane. Um, But, you know... I guess what airplane do I like flying the most? I like flying my own airplane. I have Starduster too. That's the airplane I like flying That's the most. That's a perfect transition because that was going to be my next question. What's the mission for the Starduster for you? I just, I, it's just a release of going up and, you know, trying. I mean, I still t- stay very vigilant, but it's a much more relaxed approach to flying. I, I wear shorts and I wear a T-shirt and I have, you know, I go to the airplane on a motorcycle and uh, kind of chill out and just, you know, uh, get in the airplane and I don't, I'm not doing anything that's really scripted. It's kind of just a nice, relaxed way of flying an airplane and go out and pull. I mean, most guys that are in the hangars next to me, they're like, you only fly for like 10 or 15, 20 minutes. And I go, I know, but that's just enough, right? Because I go out there and I go do a few aerobatics and stuff like that and, um, you know, just enjoy it. And, um, and, and you know, kind of just use it as kind of just a kind of just a breather. One seat or two? It's two seats. Two seats. So you can always, yeah. you can always take a passenger if you wanted to, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tailwheel airplane. Mm-hmm. I've often said, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I feel like everyone should learn to fly in a glider first, and the next airplane should be a tail dragger. Totally agree. Because it makes you, oh, man, you you can't cheat. No. You can't just plonk. I'll be honest, today is a little windy in the T6. I just put a little little more power in than I would otherwise have. 
plonked it down. Oh, I didn't plonk yeah. it down. Landed firmly is the right answer there. Uh, but what I'm getting at, Beechcraft uh, makes a great machine, right? Uh, it's much more forgiving of error if if need be. And that's what a trainer should be, a good trainer. Yeah. But man, oh man, a tailwheel airplane will keep you honest. And I think it just makes you so much a better aviator. Yeah, if you think you're good, just go fly a tailwheel airplane and see what happens. Because every landing is a discovery. And I'm the first one to admit it. And, um, you know, I fly mine on a bay minette and it's a bit of a slope strip. And I mean, if I'm going to the east, it's, it's a bit of a party trick to get it on the runway. It's always a box of chocolates, you know, because... Um, and that's the thing. It just keeps you honest, right? So if you ever think that you're just getting too good for yourself, go go plunk yourself into one of those things and see what happens, you know, because it really is every landing is different. And, and not just that. It just, it's just it's basic flying, right? It's controls this. There's no magic to it. It's you. Smoke system or no? I have a smoke system. I um the first time I used it, it was it, it was in the front seat, and I wasn't certain it was safe because it had an open battery. The the chap that built the airplane can't peach. I mean, he's a very he's an awesome builder, awesome, you know, really knows everything about it. But everything is simple, and it's it has a purpose. And so the smoke system was no different. The first time I turned it on, I turned on the battery, and I had the smoke oil in there. I mean, it looked like the airplane was on fire. I mean, there was so much smoke. I mean, it just came out from everywhere. So I'm like, holy crap. And and then it hung forever. And I went, holy crap. I mean, nobody's going to be able to take off out of this runway for 10 minutes. Um, So, yeah, I haven't used it all that much. Um, but, uh, But, yeah, it does have a smoke system. Very cool. Yeah, I've uh, got one in a box right now uh, for the RV. I'm hoping to get it installed someday soon. Oh, a real yeah, good friend of mine, uh, he st- I would jokingly say he stole my idea. He did uh, use it for a gender reveal. Uh, it's going to be a boy. It's blue. But uh, the other <laughs> the other funny side of that was it may or may not have gummed up the pump a little bit. So yeah, yeah. just a cool way to leave. Uh, I don't know, especially in this part of the world, everyone's used to the blues. It's always fun to, I'm not even close to participating on that level, but it's always fun to leave a little bit of a trail through the sky. Rooster, as we finish this up, first off, I want to say thank you so very much for giving me a sharing so much of your time, so many of your stories, so much of your experience. Uh, truly, I, I can't say anything but thank you. Um, I always end these the same way, which is letting you have the final word. So anything maybe I didn't ask or uh, anything you want to add, over over to you, sir. No, I, you know what? I, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. I think, you know, I really am a big fan of these things, and that's why I participated in it. So thank you for having me do it. That's that's what I'd like to say. And, and only because I think people, uh, this is important to document this type of stuff. And... Um, I think because, you know, it's another venue. We didn't have these opportunities to do this. Mostly it was in the pages of a magazine or something like that, maybe on a TV show or something like that. So the podcasts are so accessible to everybody. I think it really does serve a great purpose. So, yeah, I, I just like you keep on doing what you're doing. It's really cool. I'll give you some names that you, I think you should call up and do it with too, but uh, they're over down here. be an honor. Intake would be a good guy to get. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. I like it. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.